and use that. That's right. But where is the sky? Ah, here's share screen. This is what went wrong last night. Okay. There. And there should be a toolbar somewhere. And there it is. Ah, good. All right. So I can even put that on Twitter, for example. Um, copy link address is here. All right, good. All right. Um, this is crypto. There. Oh, and I should uh, put a hope tag on that. All right. Anyway. Um, all right. Well, I think we're off to a reasonable start here. All right. Let me um, talk a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, I did. I'm a, I'm a teacher at City College in San Francisco. And I've been doing a lot of uh, teaching in the security space for many years now. And I discovered when I did a lot of uh, Android app security tests that an enormous number of developers have absolutely no idea what they're doing in cryptography. It is ridiculous. As far as I can tell, something like two thirds of Android apps either store a plain text copy of your password in the apps directory unnecessarily, or they use symmetric cryptography and then try to hide the key on your phone. And I can see the source code and totally find the key. So I spent a while notifying everybody about this and almost nobody cared. But still, I care. And it occurred to me that, that obviously the developers have no idea what's going on in cryptography at all. And none of their managers or supervisors or anybody in the product chain has any idea what's going on. And they let them make ridiculous mistakes and it sails right through to production. So um, it seemed to me like there's a need for better cryptography education. I decided to teach a cryptography class. Now, my students are afraid of math, but the fact is I'm not very interested in the mathematical part of cryptography either, and I don't think any of us really should be in the following sense. Don't make your own crypto. Just forget it. If you think you are smart enough to write your own crypto, then you are an idiot, and you need to get some therapy and get over that, and then admit that what you need is for the 10 smartest people on earth to write crypto, and the rest of us just need to follow their lead. What you need to do, however, is understand how to use what they've created. If you correctly use the standard stuff like AES and RSA, you'll really be in pretty good shape. Now, there are a few people that are so brilliant, they're finding the flaws in those systems and making better systems beyond them, and that's fine. But believe me, from what I can tell, 99% of everybody just needs to learn how to use the standard stuff correctly. And that would be a big step forward. This is the thing you hear a lot from security people. Another thing I've heard a lot of them say is, you can have your super duper IDS, but if you would actually update your software, <laughs> that would be a lot more effective and change your passwords. Um, you know, simple things are what matters. So my goal here is not to really to get deeply into the math of this. My goal is engineering. Learn how to correctly use the tools that are already there. And so, um, this is just a series of projects. I've just tried to make a gamified version of a cryptography class here, but in terms of a modern application that gets people excited, there's cryptocurrencies. So I think what I want to do is starting, um, let me just try, if you want to start doing the problems right away, just go to this website, Sam Info, and Crypto Hero, and if you would like to do ordinary mathematics, like binary, there's a series of those here. There's a lesson and then there's some challenges. So here's, for example, nibbles. I'll just spend a minute on this so people can see it because I don't think this is the most exciting stuff. Although I've had conferences where this is all people did in this workshop and they thought this was great. Because if you don't know binary, you got to learn it. It's like being a musician and not being able to read music. You'll just be continually humiliated by this problem until you finally address it. Um, so nibbles. Um, nibbles. So in base 10, you have 147 is 100, four tens, and seven. But in binary, you have this number is the number of ones, and this number is the number of twos. So this number 101 is four, and no twos, and one one, so it's five. And nibbles are half of a byte. So here you can count to seven in binary. One, one, one is seven, because it's four plus two plus one. And 101 is five, because it's four plus one, but no two. And four bits make a nibble. And all there are is ones, twos, fours, and eights. So 
That'll get you to here, and you can count to 15, the highest, largest possible nibble, four ones. And if you learn to understand nibbles, then you can later go on to bites. And the game part of this is um, here. There's a challenge here where you convert these things. 10, 10 happens to be 10. I know that one, it's eight plus two. So when you get that correct, you get another. When you get 10 in a row correct, you win some points. And this is modeled on um, the Khan Academy, which teaches math the same way. And this might be easy for a lot of people, but there are some that get a little more challenging. And um, let me move up to a somewhat lower, higher level this. There's bytes and hexadecimal, but modular arithmetic is one that sure. begins to be newer. Um, in cryptography, you're taking input, which is something like bytes from 0 to 255, and you want to scramble it and still have 0 to 255 bytes at the end. So you can't do the normal kind of math where you add and multiply things and they get bigger. You want to work on a ring. And that is a kind of math that we're not so used to as that stuff. So here's modulus 9. You have like a clock face and you have go from 0 to 8. So 0 plus 1 is 1 and 1 plus 1 is 2 and 7 plus 1 is 8 but 8 plus 1 is 0 again. And 8 times 2 is 1, I think. I, I, maybe I'd be, it might be uh, eight, plus, 8 times 2 is 7. Because what you do is you take 16 and you divide by 9 and keep the remainder. So you take away 9 and there's 7 left. This is how modular arithmetic works. You run around a ring. You can do the same math. You can do addition and multiplication and subtraction, but there is no division, which we're going to get to in a minute. But it's always, you never leave this ring. The answers are always from 0 to 8. And here's uh, that's modulus 9 only uses the numbers from 0 to 8. You go around as many times as you like. You can have negative numbers. Negative numbers just go the other way. So minus 1 is 8, minus 2 is 7, and so on. All right, you can do addition. And when you do, you can, if you want to add 1 plus 5 in mod 9, it's 6. You can add it and then take the modulus. If you want to take 15 plus 13 in mod 9, there are two ways to do it. You can take this mod 9 and get, um, well, first you can add it to get 28, and then do 28 mod 9. You take away the, the 27, which is 3 times 9, and you have one left over. So the answer is 1. Or you can do them individually. 15 mod 9 is 6. 13 mod 9 is 4. So this is 10 mod 9. That's the distributed property. You can... Uh, take the modular of the individual components, or you can add them. So here's some more stuff. 7 minus 2, mod 9 is 5. You go back by 2. 7 minus 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is 2. All right, you can do modulus 4. You're just going to go 0 to 3, and then 0 and 1, and so on. Here, modulus 6, that's the pattern. So there's a game where you can practice doing that. And... So 28, 38 mod 20, you take away multiples of 20. So there's a 20 in there, there's 18 left over, so that's 18. 80 mod 9, um, 81 is a pattern of 9, and so is 72. So that's 72 plus 8. So 8 is the remainder, and so you go. This is simple modular arithmetic. Now, I'm going to show you the last bit, which is something a lot of people found interesting enough to spend some time working on before, which is inverses. The, prop, the, way, the reason we're doing this is cryptography. We are going to have a ring, and we are going to use a key and scramble the data, which is going to move things around the ring to encrypt it. And then to decrypt it, we're going to have to reverse that process. And the problem is there is multiplication, but there is no division. And that's what you would need. So you have to learn what replaces division in modular arithmetic. And let me clear out my extra. OK. So here's what happens. In modular 9, remember, I can go 0 to 8, and then when I go to 9, I'm back to 0, and so on. Um, suppose I take 2 times 9 mod 9. If I'm going to encrypt something by multiplying it by 9, uh, I'm going to get 2 times 9 will, of course, give me 0. Multiplying anything by 9 will give me 0 because I'll end up with a multiple of 9. 2 times 10 mod 9 will give me 2 times 1, which is 2. Now. If I have 2 times 9 mod 9, I get 18, I end up with 0. If I have 2 times 10 mod 9, I get 2. So if I take 2 times 5 mod 9, I end up at 10, and that takes me back to 1. Now, this is what I'm looking for. If you can find numbers which, when multiplied, result in 1, 
you've now found the multiplicative inverse. So if you encrypt with a key of two, in order to decrypt, you encrypt again with a key of five. Because five is the multiplicative inverse of two. So if you double something and you want to get back where you started, you have to multiply it by five to get back where you started. Multiplicative inverses do not always exist, but you need them for cryptography. So that's an issue. And now sometimes you're not going to find them. Six, for example, in mod nine, if I have six and then I multiply it by two, I go around six more, I end up at three. Another six gets me to zero. Another six gets me to six. I just run around these numbers. I never explore any other numbers. So there is no inverse for six. There is nothing you can do that will get you back to one. So there are certain types, certain rings, and certain keys that cannot be used for cryptography. You can scramble stuff, but you can't unscramble it like bad ransomware. So anyway, that's the game. Uh, these, there is no simple way to find these modular, rhythms, these modular inverses, but I do have a game where you practice finding them. You're just going to have to try multiplication until you find it. And that's included in the cryptography we're going to do. And there's one more math lesson. I just want to show it to you. Now, I should mention, this is the wrong way to teach math. This is emphatically the wrong way to teach math. Most of my students are traumatized by math because they get instruction like this that goes too fast. But I'm doing it here because I'm, in my class, I never do it this way. I have one five-minute section at the end of each class where you do one thing, and that's it. The next week, you do one more, and it builds. That's the right way to learn math. The reason I'm doing it here, of course, is I only have a couple hours, and this is only a small part of the class. So I just want you to see what's available so you can decide what part is of interest to you. But uh, you, should, you should do what the Khan Academy people do. You make it a game. You do it while it's fun. You learn one thing, and then you quit and try to get another day and make sure it stays fun. If it gets complicated and frustrating, then you quit and try doing smaller steps. Because if you can count on your fingers, you can do math. It is no harder than that. The only thing that makes it hard is a psychological issue, which is once you understand math, it is very easy. And the teacher thinks it's easy. And you try it, and it's hard because you don't understand it yet. So you think, there's something wrong with me. The teacher is smarter than me. That's not true at all. All it is, you have to do one step and practice until you've got it before you do the next step. And that's what this is intended to do. And if you do that, you will discover that it never gets any harder than counting on your fingers, at least at the kind of math I'm doing. Anyway, XOR is another exchange that we're going to use a lot in cryptography. And let me get that up. XOR is a simple way to scramble data. So if you have one bit that's either zero or one, the way XOR works is if the two bits are different, the answer is one. If the two bits are the same, the answer is zero. That's it. Now, you, when I first heard of this being used in cryptography, I wondered why they didn't use and and or. And and or have a truth table with three ones in it, or three zeros. And that destroys information. If you get into entropy and Shannon uh, information theory, it leads to this. But you can understand this quite easily. If I write something like a text document where all the letters are from A through Z, I use a whole byte that has 256 possibilities, but I only put one letter in there that only has 26 possibilities. So you can tell that's not full of information. If I compress it with a zip file, it will get smaller and it will use all the bytes. So something that uses all possible values of the bytes randomly is considered to have the most information in it. And if I fill in, if I use a cryptographic transformation, if I feed in data that's half ones and half zeros, and I feed in a key that's half ones and half zeros, and a use exclusive or, the result will still be half ones and half zeros. That is important. If I used or or and, the result would be three quarters ones and only one quarter zeros. And that would destroy information because that file would now have patterns that could be zipped. So I would never be able to get back to the original message because my transformation would have destroyed information. So this transformation of XOR is real important in cryptography because it does scramble data and it can be reversed. And in fact, you reverse it by just XORing again with the same key. Now, the XOR, however, only encrypts one bit, if you want to call it encryption. It only changes one bit. So you can do them in Python, 0 XOR, 0 is 0, 0 XOR, 1 is 1, and so on. If you have two bits, you just do them one by one. So the first bit is 0, the second bit is 0, the answer is 0. And the same for the second bit. Here, the first bit is 0, and the second bit is 0, so I get 0. The second bit is zero, and the second bit of this one is one, so I get one. You just XOR each bit one by one. 
So anything you can put in bits, you can XOR it. So you can do four bits. If I have four zeros and a 1,000, the right three are 0 XOR 0, which gives me 0. The one on the left is 0 XOR 1, which gives me 1. So that's how it works. And you can therefore do whole bytes. So I've got a, um, a game here where you practice doing it. And it's another thing. So 14 XOR 11, this is a little annoying. And this is why it would be real useful to naturally understand binary first. And that's why these things are in this order. You have to turn them both into binary. So 14 is 1110, and 11 is 1011. Because it's 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. This is 8 plus 2 is 10, plus one more is 11. So now you can XOR them, and you'll get 0, 1, 0, 1. Because if the two bits here are different, you get a one. If the two bits are the same, you get zero. So the answer is five. And that's the process you have to go to to get here. Five is the right answer. So when you get to where you can get 10 in a row right there, then you're considered to have mastered that lesson in my system and in the Khan Academy where I got this idea. Because this is what I did in like first grade. In third grade, they taught us like addition. And if you just practiced adding, the teacher would go around and help us until we were done learning how to do adding. And then they would teach us nothing more until another day. Because that was enough for one day. And I remember this being fun. Oh, that was fun. That was a fun little game. I would, next week we learned subtracting. And I never had this traumatic hatred of math that most of my students have because nobody tortured me by doing 10 steps in front of me and calling me stupid for not getting them all right away. They taught me one step and then we practiced until we got it. So that's the way to do it. Anyway, that's the math part. That's as far as we go in math here, except for a couple of the really advanced challenges. Um, but what I'd like to do now is skip ahead and talk about blockchains. So you understand what we're talking about here? This is all the rage. Everybody is talking about blockchains, and I'm going to talk about it too, because it is a very interesting application of cryptography. And it got everyone's attention because a lot of people are telling us that they made a ton of money. Um, all right, so um, I should say I have, I, I was just proposing a talk to another conference, and I was, they, they didn't, they said I was too late or something, and I said, it's probably just as well because they'd probably lynch me if I gave my talk. But the talk last night at Hope was almost as negative as I planned to be. So um, I, the reason I'm totally negative about blockchains and Bitcoin, for Bitcoin, not so much blockchains, is because I have of my history. I was a financial professional of sorts. I was the database administrator working under contract to the Federal Trade Commission on pyramid schemes for years. I became an expert on the finances of pyramid schemes, and that is what all these things are. They are just pyramid schemes. The early adopters are just stealing money from the late adopters. By the time you hear anything, you should invest in this because it's hot, it's already too late, and you're just the sucker being sheared. So anybody that comes to you and says, invest in my blockchain, you're going to get rich, just punch them in the face and walk away. <laughs> Don't give them your money. By the time you hear about it, it is already far too late. And I lived this for years. When I was a kid, my dad said, don't buy that junk on TV. They're all just ripping you off. And I said, oh, you're just a bitter old cynical man. And then I worked on the fraud desk and I became the same bitter cynical old man. Every single thing advertised on TV, came across my desk four years later as those people that bought the miracle floor wax and the oil that can drip out of your car and keeps working and the lose weight without dieting or all trying to get 5% of their money back because it's all bunk. Anyway, so this is bunk too. But anyway, it's one thing that is not bunk is blockchains. They actually are some applications. So anyway, um, let's talk about blockchains. And for that, I want to show you a video that some student, a student showed me years ago, and I thought this is wonderful, and it's only two minutes long. And this is good and bad in equal measures. You know, <laughs> I wonder if I can actually use this amplified sound. I see a plug here. I do not know if this is going to work. Let's try it and see what happens. Um, okay, there's a tiny bit of sound. Is there a way to turn it up? No. On the back of what? There's a knob. All right. Uh, is there a volume knob? Uh, here. Yep, it's all the way up. All right. I'm just going to not bother with the volume. Okay. 
I'll do my presentation here instead. All right, these are the blockchains. You have these blocks of data, and they're being assembled. And the idea is you have many different people that are unconnected to each other. Um, in a centralized system, like the Bank of America, you have one central database, and you trust them. In a decentralized system, you have more. And what you try to have here is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system where there is no central authority anywhere. Now, this is a Merkle tree, which we'll talk more about. So each block, you calculate the hash value and put it in the next block. So the idea is, all you have to do is verify the latest block. And if the hash comes out correct, that means the entire chain is accurate up to that point. So all you have here is something essentially like a signed data file where you can be sure it's right. Now, uh, the video, the audio here, which is not loud enough to play in this room, um, is entertaining because they now start lying to you. Everybody in this business is fantastic liars and crooks with a possible few exceptions, one being Coinbase in San Francisco and the people who make multi-chain. There may be some other honest people in here, but I haven't come across them. Um, well, the guy giving a talk last night seemed reasonably honest, um, but they all tell you the fact that it's distributed means that nobody can sniff anything by because everybody will notice, uh, notwithstanding the fact that many of these systems have been hacked monstrously. Um, and then they tell you that blockchains will drive your car and make it safer. Blockchains will make it possible to identify who you're talking to in a chat room so you know they're not a crook. And blockchains will perfect your privacy. And though if that makes no sense to you, that's because it makes no sense. Then the point, and then as the guy mentioned last night, the number one application of blockchains is scams. Blockchains are a dizzying thing to distract you with while I pick your pocket. And that is 90% of the time all that's going on. Some kind of flim flam to distract you while I pick your pocket. But, so the cryptocurrency part, where you actually issue money of your own and get people to buy it, is nothing more than the worst kind of penny stock. I'm going to sell you stock in my company that often doesn't even exist. You're going to give me your money because I will promise you money later, and then I will just leave. And that's essentially what happens to most people that invest in this stuff. But the technology underneath it is blockchains, and that's interesting. And we're gonna play with it here a little bit later. But Bitcoin itself um, was, has two functions, and one which may possibly appeal to people here more than others is the political issue. The uh, point of Bitcoin is to protest government involvement in money. Now that I put this out here, you wanna teach kids about Bitcoin, give them piggy banks. Six months later, <laughs> smash them, steal the money, and laugh. <laughs> now, now they understand what they need to understand about Bitcoin. Um, but anyway, uh, so the reason, so Bitcoin is a system of making digital money, which can be traded, but why does anybody pay anything for it? Well, the answer is nobody did for the first two years. It was worth zero. It was just a mathematical curiosity that a few people played with, but then some killer apps appeared and they're all money laundering. Money laundering is the only reason Bitcoin is worth a penny. And so Silk Road came so you could purchase murder for hire and drugs and guns online. And then ransomware came out so people could extract money from you uh, without having to pass it through a system that would make it easy to figure out who they were or so they thought. And of course, there are a lot of countries with terrible uh, inflation problems like Argentina, where the local currency is so terrible, you can't use it as a store of value. So people engage in what's illegal there and want to trade their money into another currency and trading into Bitcoin is the one convenient form of money laundering for them to escape the local regulations that are bad for them. But in 2017, a new one came out, which is just raw speculation. People bought it because other people were buying it. And that's just a bubble, and that's madness. It is incredible how much money got stolen. Now, almost everybody that bought Bitcoin in the early days bought it at Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox just lost or stole all the money. But anyway, that was 7% of all the Bitcoins in the world gone. Um, there's a lot of story about it uh, going back and forth. Uh, many, another bunch of them got stolen at Bitfinex and this exchange and that exchange and that hack and that hack. And a lot of these people got hacked and a whole lot of them just stole the money and left and didn't even hide it. That's why he had a slide last night of maybe five tech companies where it actually admitted they just stole the money and left. The rest of them had the decency to pretend they got hacked and steal the money and leave. And some of them probably do get hacked because in addition to being crooks, they're also pretty clumsy with their security. But um, by the way, if you actually know what you're doing, nobody can steal your money because you can have a private key that you don't give to anybody else. You keep yourself someplace on a thumb drive and then nobody else can steal your money unless they steal that thumb drive. But most investors don't know that. So they trust their exchange with basically a blank check or with the money they give them. And then 
they haven't escaped the centralized system at all. They've, in fact, taken the previous centralized system, which was backed by the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, and, and the banks and the laws, and replaced it by trusting some unknown person on the Internet where you don't even know what country they're in. It's a big step down in security. So many, many, many heists got stolen. And then when the Secret Service got involved, they started stealing it too. The agents are going to prison for stealing the Bitcoins that Ross Ulbricht had when they shut down um, Silk Road. So here's the price history. For years, Bitcoin was worth nothing. It was just the province of enthusiasts. Then there's a small bubble here because Silk Road appeared. And then in 2017, something unbelievable happened. And Bitcoin went up to around $20,000. And I watched this happen and everybody was screaming and yelling and being excited. And I was being bitter and cynical and, and <laughs> sarcastic about it. And I remember some of my students bought in at $8,000. And I said, oh, I wouldn't invest in that junk. It's going up. It'll be fine. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, the point is, why in the world is Bitcoin at the end of 2017 worth 10 times as much as it was at the start of 17? What is it you could do that you couldn't do? And the answer is nothing. There's no reason for it at all. So um, I wondered about this. There's a lot of people analyzing it. There's more sober financial analysts did this. So I wondered about bubbles. You know, bubbles are when something goes up just because it's going up. Bitcoin went up much faster than the tech bubble, the one that made the internet in around 2000. But the, I, and I thought, especially after the last presidential election, I thought perhaps you're having a paroxysm of stupidity in the world that has never been seen before. But that is not true. It has been seen before. Here's us previous bubbles. And the Bitcoin bubble almost perfectly parallels the tulip bubble, which happened in 1637, when they'd never seen tulips in, I think, Holland. And so they, someone introduced tulips, and they started trading them. And within a few months, people were trading them for the price of a mansion, when they were obviously not worth that. But it was going up, and it was going up. And it goes up, and then it crashes, of course. And Bitcoin has crashed. And uh, so anyway. There's investing in Bitcoin for you. So uh, there are other ones out there. The Bitcoin was primarily just intended, well, that's actually kind of entertaining. Bitcoin, Bitcoin was apparently intended to be a political protest or perhaps a medium exchange or perhaps a store of value, sort of like many other religions. Every time you prove that it is not fulfilling one of the goals, it claims that was never the goal and there was some other goal, but it in fact fails at all these things. It's not a store of value because it wildly oscillates. It's not a means of exchange because transactions have a high transaction fee and they have a very slow, even when it works correctly, it takes an hour before a transaction is finalized. So you're not going to buy a cup of coffee with that. But anyway, um, other, other blockchains came out. There is a very strong belief that there is some real value here based on very little leverage. But Ethereum has ability to do more transactions per second, but the real financial professionals are just laughing at this. The Bitcoin blockchain can do three to four transactions per second, Ethereum can do 20 transactions, Visa's doing 2,000 transactions per second. That's where everyone really uses your money. So they're just looking at it and saying, well, you know what's going on here is a couple of computer nerds are playing a game with money and pretending that they're changing the world when in fact they're just a drop in the bucket and I don't know what they're talking about. And this is the huge problem that no one has addressed. These public blockchains do not scale to any actual use. Um, you can make prototypes, and here's the mean of exchange, which is not, it's not a store of value. Gold is the classic store of value. And there's these initial coin offerings, almost all of which are used only to get original investors and scam them. And so this is uh, something I remember as a kid, you can, you can go some distance off the cliff before you fall. And that's what these bubbles are. Anyway, um, Bitcoin is also not decentralized. Bitcoin is completely controlled by China. The Chinese government has chosen not to directly manipulate Bitcoin, but at any time they wanted to, they could just steal all the money. Because the whole point of the decentralization system is if 51% of the people, it would take a conspiracy of 51% of the miners to lie about the blockchain. But since the protocol is designed to where the only thing that matters is the speed of the CPU, it's all done in China, where they can get free electricity through government corruption. So, um, in fact, it's not decentralized at all in practice. So, anyway, um, people got upset about the power generation. This was a big thing. Bitcoin was going up to where it was like 0.1% of all the power in the world. And people predicted if you draw a straight line... You'll use up all the power in the world by 2022. So I said, well, this is ridiculous. And I put out this chart on Twitter and thought that would make people shut up because we've been here before. They did the same thing in 2000. They said, 1999, the internet was here. 2000, it was here. In five years, I'll be rich, rich, rich. And I said, yeah, that just means it's going to, I'm not going to keep going up. 
but I put this out and people said, oh, that's really scary. They're going to use up all the power in the world. I said, no, isn't it obvious what that means? And they said, no. So I said, well, let's try this one. How long is it going to be before it uses up all the energy of the sun or the entire universe will be turned into Bitcoin in the year 2100? If it keeps rising at the current rate, that's the entire mass energy of the universe. And I put that out and people said, oh my God, I'm really scared now. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> there's got to be some point when you will realize the meaning of this graph is that it isn't going to keep going up like this. <laughs> anyway, uh, which it did, obviously. So Ethereum is intended to move beyond Bitcoin storing money to doing contracts on the blockchain, and we'll play with those. You'll see them in live. But I just mentioned what a colossal disaster and failure Ethereum is. It is absolutely worthless for anything useful, although people don't like to admit it. And one of the perfect examples of that is CryptoKitties, which you mentioned last night. CryptoKitties is a game you play reinvesting catch. It rose like crazy until November of last year. I bought a few for a few bucks, and I gave them out to students as prizes. And then when I gave this talk, or the talk after this one, a month later, around December, I could not give them to my students. I submitted the transaction to send it to my students and the transaction failed because CryptoKitty got so popular it saturated the blockchain because the blockchain can only handle a few transactions per second. So the only point of Ethereum is you can have a contract, you can show that it is working in a prototype stage and when you actually scale up to real use, it will collapse and not work. And they've been trying to fix that with no real, no real luck. And so CryptoKitties fell from its peak in, two, in November of last year, down to one and a half percent of the transactions. And it is still the number four most popular application on Ethereum because everyone else figured out the same thing, which is you can't actually do anything that achieves any popularity on a blockchain. Because the whole point, of, you, normally you write software and you try to make it fast. But if that bores you, you can try to make your software slow. If you put a program on the blockchain, now a million computers have to repeat every step of the code. So you've made your computer a million times slower for some very questionable security benefit. And then you wonder, hey, my program's too slow. What happened here? Well, you optimized for making it slow. So it's kind of madness. And Ethereum forked to try to undo the disaster of the DAO, which was supposed to prove it worked and totally proved the opposite. And now there's a lot of these out there. And many, many scams came out. So let me show you some of the, yeah. Oh, a cartoon? Oh, which one? This one? Oh, this is just a drawing. Talk, this is when the DAO forked. When the Ethereum forked to save the DAO, that was his issue. Um, there was a huge <laughs> argument at the time that forking the Ethereum would cause investors to lose faith in it, which totally did not happen, but it would have made sense if it had. Um, anyway, so here we are. Um, and by the way, I'll mention, if you want to learn more about this reasons to hate Bitcoin, this book is awesome. Attack of the 50-foot blockchain. This is a guy really explaining how blockchains got where they are and how the, what they promised and what they actually delivered. So I was just totally fed up with this. And I said, blockchains and Bitcoin are all just snake oil and garbage. And then I taught this class a couple months ago in Indiana. And I met guys who were actually working on blockchain projects. And most of them, I said, your project makes no sense. But one guy had a project that made sense. And I was surprised to see that talk last night. He agreed with me. And this was supply chain management. This guy was working at Lockheed Martin. And he's developing a blockchain solution so that they can work with their suppliers. And the point is, you make a contract with suppliers, they promise to deliver stuff, then if they're late, they gotta pay, you gotta know when does it ship, when did it arrive, and we all have to agree on that. So it turns out, in a small closed network of a few machines under private control, a blockchain is another way to synchronize data, that's all it is. If you have a file and you wanna give that file to other computers, we already have a lot of ways to do that. There's FTP, there's HTTP, there's BitTorrent, there's Dropbox, there's Windows Update, all these take a file from one machine and put it on another machine, and a lot of them then make some attempt to make sure that it was not altered in the process. And all a blockchain is, is a system of doing that specifically tailored for financial transactions. But all it's doing is making sure that a bunch of machines have an accurate copy of a file and trading the data back and forth. It's not gigantic revolutionary step forward, but it is of some value in some cases. So there's some projects here where you use these. And first, all you need is a browser. So here, there's a tutorial, which will summarize what I just said, and you can skip it if you like. And you can go to this live blockchain demo. So here's a simplified blockchain intended to work the way Bitcoin does. So here's how it works. Right now, there's no data stored in any of the blocks. So let's put some data in a block. And I'm gonna say Sam has 10 coins. Okay, when I did that, this block is now invalid. 
the hash is no good. Now, you can always calculate the hash of any block of data, and it did, but the way you work in Bitcoin is you require the hash to start with a certain number of zeros, just arbitrarily, just to make it difficult. Now, the hash is one value, so in order to be able to vary it, you have to have this nonce, which is a number you can change. So you try nonce values, that's what mining does, until you make the hash start with a number of zeros. Looks like five zeros is what they want here. Now it turns green because it has been mined. Somebody had to try thousands and thousands of nonce values until they found one that made the hash start with a lot of zeros. Now you call that one mined. Now you can put data in this one, and the miner will get a reward. So if Sally's the miner this time, she's going to get 10 coins. And maybe Sam sends Bill five coins. Okay, so I put some data in there. Then this block gets mined. And somebody gets an award for mining it, and somebody records it. And now you can have more and more data here and mine them. So you have this chain of data. And the point of the thing is, when this one mines, yes. All right, if it's, there we are. So now all three of these are green because they've all been mined. Now, if somebody tries to lie and change this one, this one is invalid, and so is the next one. So if you look at the latest one and it's valid, that proves they're all valid up to that point. That's the idea of a blockchain, which is called a Merkle tree. And that's the point. So it should be fairly easy to um, have clients that can use the blockchain, and the miners have to do a lot of work to dig through all this stuff. And that's what makes public blockchain so crazy. You let the whole world play the game, and they have to compete. And here's something that only came out about a month ago in direct practice that has not reached its fruition yet. There's something like a 1,000 cryptocurrencies out there initial coin offerings, almost all of them completely bogus, all of them much smaller, and yet they use proof of work, many of them, and proof of work only works if you are the fastest computer on earth. That's why the Chinese are the only ones actually winning the race. Everybody on earth races to mine a block. Whoever gets the block mined first wins and they get the Bitcoins. So the fastest computer on earth makes money. All the ones that aren't the fastest lose the race and get nothing. So there can only be one cryptocurrency on earth that is secured by proof of work. And this is what people begun to realize. If you are a Bitcoin miner, but you're not the best, you don't get any money on Bitcoin. So what you do is you go down to Litecoin or one of the smaller coins, which nobody else is mining, and you'll be the king of that space. You'll win all the time. In fact, you could even be 51% of the mining power of that space, and then you can just steal all the money. So there, if, even if proof of work is accepted as a valid way of securing your blockchain, which you might argue it is for Bitcoin, it is logically, makes no sense at all for proof of work to be trusted at any other level. Because the only thing that makes it secure is that you have to be the fastest computer in the world. But uh, that has not happened in a large scale yet, but it's beginning to happen. Anyway, so there's a project here where you play with this one and get some points by setting up some stuff and mining it and seeing how it goes. And there's a challenge down here. And then there's a, you can play another one here and make some changes and see these transactions. Here's more realistic transactions in another version of that thing where you see the money and you see the Coinbase, which is the account that gives you new coins. It mints fresh coins to give them to you as an award. And that's how Bitcoin works. The next thing you got to do if you want to do the blockchains is set up an Ubuntu server and we can help you. The simplest way though, which I highly recommend, is to just rent one. Um, why did it not open? There. If you just go to DigitalOcean for 17 cents a day, you can rent a machine. So if you have 17 cents you can spare, you can just rent a server, which is what everybody does. I mean, if you're starting a business and you buy a computer, you just made your first mistake. You should have just used a cloud machine these days. People figured this out years ago. So that's what I recommend. Just rent a server at DigitalOcean to, to use for this stuff you're doing today. But if you want to make your own, you can do that. I've got some sticks with Ubuntu. You can also download from Ubuntu.com. Get an Ubuntu server. And once you get it working, you'll get some points. And I'll show you some more challenges here that require that Ubuntu server. But I think I want to pause until more people get on the board. So do some of these things. You can do the binary games, or you can set, do that blockchain demo, or set up your Ubuntu server. And I just want to make sure people are moving before I go ahead. Because I don't want to just talk all the time. I want you to be doing stuff. If you get stuck, yeah. just raise your hand and yeah. I'll come help you. Yeah. And, uh, I'm gonna, I've got to look at the scores. That's how I can see how people are doing. Let me see. There are three or four people doing this class before it started. Oh, this will all be up after the class is over, too. You can do this stuff later.
Oh, yeah, a bunch of people are on the board. Yeah, I'm glad to see it. They're mostly doing the binary games, which is perfectly fine. Like I say, a lot of people just do the binary games, and that's all they do, and that's fine. If you don't know binary, that's a really good thing to learn. You won't regret learning binary. But this guy's been doing it for two days now. He doesn't count. The rest of those people are actually here, probably, or most of them. All right. And I'm going to pause for a little while to let people work. So I'm going to pause this share, which only one person is looking to anyway. Cosmo, I hope you can see the desktop, Cosmo. All right. But I'm going to pause the recording if I can figure out how to do that. Um, pause recording. So this is multi-chain. Now, I, uh, when I learned about Bitcoin, I installed my own version and started running a Bitcoin server. And I, then I learned about Ethereum and I set up a test Ethereum network and my students did that for a class or two. And that turned out to really be a lot of work and really disturbing because the problem with Bitcoins is really slow. You only have one block every 10 minutes. And the problem with Ethereum is it's really fast. You get a block every 15 seconds. And in either case, after a month or two, it swells up to gigabytes of data. So it takes forever for anybody to get anything done. And if they have a slow internet connection, it takes too long to synchronize. And I wanted to customize it. So I was going to modify the Bitcoin code, but that looked kind of more difficult than I wanted it to be. And then I discovered multi-chain. Now, multi-chain is one of those few companies that I have respect for in this space. These guys are not crooks. If you go to their website, they are full of informative blog articles. When I went there, the first article I saw was why you don't need the blockchain. They are not, they have no coin. There's no cryptocurrency from these guys. They are Swiss developers and they write software and they write good software and they make it available for free and you can pay for them to consult and help you set up your project, which is how they make their money. But they don't lie to you about the value of this stuff. They made a really useful point, which is banks can't use Bitcoin at all or any of these blockchains for very simple reason, everything is public, which is why it's insane that everybody's trying to commit crime using Bitcoin because there's a public record of everything you did, which is nuts. And that violates all the privacy regulations for banking. So you can't put your bank account in a public blockchain. Um, and so they said most simple financial transactions are not gonna benefit from this, certainly not the public kind. But they make software, which is a modified version of Bitcoin, and it really works, and it's very easy to use. So once you have an Ubuntu machine working, all you, now what I do, I used to use virtual machines and use something called VMware tools so I could click and have a GUI on these machines, and I gave it up because I'm, using, I'm switching to using cloud machines for everything, where I'm never anywhere near the machine. So the right way to do it is use SSH to get to your machines. This is what I'm switching to. This, therefore, my machine could be anywhere. It could be up in the cloud or local, and I have a, command, a terminal in it through SSH, which is what I'm using. Anyway, I'm going to try to do this live. Let's see how it goes. Um, right, I'm going to remove my – right, this thing has been used for multi-chains. So in my home directory, I have a directory called dot multi-chain. And I have something here called Multi-Chain Explorer. I'm going to remove that. This is how you delete a blockchain. First, you see if it's running. Um, netstat minus pant will show me what's listening. And if it's running, it will be running chain and listening on a port. And it is not running right now. So my blockchain has stopped, which is fine. Since it's not running, I can just delete it. I'm going to remove my blockchain. Now, the whole point of a blockchain is that many people have joined. They each have their own copy of the data. So you haven't really gotten rid of all the data until you've destroyed all those copies. But when I delete mine and stop running the client, I'm no longer playing the game. Like you have one machine, you take Dropbox off it. It doesn't remove the data except from that one machine. So this gets rid of my old multi-chain, and I can put on a new one. Now, um, once I'm in, in order to install multi-chain, you do that, and that's it. Just a couple of commands to download it and run it, bang, you're done. There's not much to it. And it is based on Bitcoin, but it is adjusted with several adjustments to make it better. Um, the most immediate advantage, which is huge, is that it doesn't mine unless something is happening. So if you have a private test network that does not have constant transactions, it doesn't keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't get any bigger than it has to be. So that means it's appropriate for test projects and homework and small private uses. Then it has some other advantages that we're going to see a little later. 
So now I'm going to create a blockchain. I just used the utility to create the chain. So I'm going to do that first. Okay, now I have created a chain. This has set the parameters, but it's not generated yet. This just prepares it to make a chain. It's not going to create the chain until I do this. This is going to launch the blockchain server. And it's going to launch it in background mode. It's going to pick a random port, which is 8371. And now I am serving up my blockchain to anybody that wants to join. They have to execute this command to get in. They have to be able to reach me over the network, which is only possible on my machine because I'm using a virtual machine. But I could do it on a public cloud, and we'll get there. But if I execute that command, another machine can join. So let's try using my other machine and join. I'm going to copy that command and go to my other machine. I'm going to delete the old blockchain. I'll first make sure it's not running. So net sudo net stat minus pant and a password. And I look to see if it is listening and it's not listening. Multi-chain D is not currently running. So that's fine. Now I can remove the old blockchain. Remove minus force dot multi-chain. Okay. Um, hmm. Minus R. There. Okay. Now um, I can put in that command, which I copied, and that would join the blockchain. So what happened is it tried to connect to the seed node, and it found the seed node and was able to download information about the blockchain, but now I'm not allowed to join. This is what multi-chain added to Bitcoin is permissions. I'm not allowed to join. I can detect the server. It's really there, but you can't join until you have permission to join. So I'll have to give this guy some permissions. I'm going to give him permission to connect and send and receive. Those are all separate. You could have some or all, or all of them. And this is my address. So it connected. It created an address to join the chain, which is this long mess, one UP. But I can't do anything yet until I get permissions from the administrator. So on the administrator machine, I now grant this person some info, those permissions. And this is the reply telling me it worked. Um, and now, if I just repeat the same command here, now it works. Now I have joined, and now this machine is also serving and uh, could be connected to by other people if they have connect permissions. So now I got a couple of machines on the chain. Now I can issue assets, and um, you can control things. If I go here, I can use this command line tool. We're not going to use this much because command line tools aren't that much fun. but you can control the thing from the command line, and you do it here. Multi-chain CLI, the name of your chain, and then help, and it'll give you a list of commands. These are exactly the same commands you have in Bitcoin, with only a few changes. Um, and if I want to learn more, like get info, get info will tell me information about the current blockchain. So let me go there, which is here, okay. So here's information about my blockchain. Uh, it has a version number and a number which a, a name which is chain one, and the number of blocks set up blocks is sixty. The current number of blocks in my chain is twelve, which is very very wonderful because not much has happened. All that's happened is a couple of people have connect created accounts and someone joined my chain. That is not much data, and the chain doesn't have to be very big to store that much data, and it does not keep growing. You can do it on either node. All right. Now I can get chain tips to get the status of my chain. And when you do that, you'll be able to get your points to show that you got this far. Now that's as far as I want to go without a GUI. This is no fun without a GUI. So you have to install PHP and some junk here to get it going. And um, now this is going to use the RPC, which lets you make web requests to do things to the chain. And this is how most everything is really done with all mining software and wallets and such. And therefore, there has to be some security. The security is in these files. The, the RPC is listening on a port, which is different than the port you join the chain on. And it has a password, which is automatically generated. So if I'm on the main machine and I put it in, there's the um, port is 8370. And the password is this horrible mess here. And that's the point. You cannot do anything without sending that password over the network, and that is what's supposed to make it secure. All right. Now, um, is there anything, is there any, is it only with that shared key, or? Uh, yes. The RPC just has one password. There's nothing else fancy about it. Um, uh, there's no two-factor authentication or anything, not in multi-chain. Um, however, you could add that externally. 
by having to have to VPN to a certain box and then use it. Um, and you can, of course, block this port on your firewall, and only let authorized people get at the RPC port, which is a good thing to do. Now, there, in order to make the GUI work, I have to edit this file called config.test. And let me just check. I think it's in var wwhtml. And then, yeah, it's in here, config.txt. So I'm going to nano sudo nano that file. Uh, multi config.txt. Okay. And I'm going to need these two facts to put in there. Okay, I'm going to copy them. Okay, so now that I'm in that file, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to copy in the stuff in my clipboard. There. Okay, so the RPC password is that, which is what has to go here. All right. And the port is 8370. All right, and in case I fouled it up, I'm gonna save these lines and just comment them out. All right, so if I've done that right, my GUI should now work. And um, I have to restart Apache which is here. Okay. And now I should be serving that up on this address, 172.16.1.130. Let's try it. 172.16.1.130. Okay, that's a default Apache page, which is fine. I think I need a URL. I think I need to go to multi-chain web demo. Yep. Um, Yep, multi-chain web demo. I'll just copy it. And then we can play with this thing from the GUI. Got to get rid of that dot at the end. There we go. Okay, so I can now choose an available node. Now, I have a couple other nodes I've made in other classes, but the one I made now is called default because I didn't change the name. So I connect to that, and here I am in my node. So this tells me the name of the chain. This is much friendlier than having to put those long command lines. So now I can see what's going on on my chain. Here's, I have the home node as the address 1A. There's another node connected with the address 1U. That's the other machine that's joined. Now I can do things. I can, for example, issue an asset. I can now have an asset called, say, pennies. And I can issue a 1,000 of them and I can let them go by units of one, say, and I'm gonna give them to me. I could send them to the other person. There are currently two addresses that have the ability to receive things, but I'm gonna send it to me, so the master is gonna have the issued asset, a thousand pennies. I issue the asset, this happens on the blockchain, and here's the information. It was issued by this person, and they're there. Now, I'm going to issue another asset, which is going to be dimes. What about, what about the, um, the error message? The yeah, no. yeah, I'm not going to worry about it right now. It might be a problem. It might not be. This, by the way, is all beta software written by third parties. Um, so far, I think it's still working. But yes, that, by the way, invites you to another level of horror. None of this software is very good. And people are putting millions of dollars in it. And you're always ignoring stuff like that. This is, you're right to be worried about that. <laughs> Anyway, I'm just going to issue these things, uh, 100 dimes with units of one going to the same place. So now my, I have two assets. I've got pennies and i got dimes. Now, let me catch up with my, my main node here. Here's a couple errors you can get and some fixes. Let me shrink this a bit. All right. So I issued an asset. All right. Now I want to send coins to the secondary node. So let's go send. And let's send, um, pennies are fine. Let's send 100 pennies to the other guy, which is one UP. So I will send that asset. And because the other guy has received permission, they're able to get it. And again, I've got some kind of error message up here that I'm just sloppily ignoring. So now if I go and look 
at my assets, I should be able to see that I don't have as many anymore, um, but I'm not right away. Send maybe, yeah, here's my assets. Now I only have 900 pennies and 100 dimes. I had 1,000 pennies and I sent 100 to somebody else. So that's working. Now, here's one of the things which is a big deal about multi-chain. If you want to do financial transactions, then what you really want is an atomic exchange transaction. One way, suppose I want to change a dime for 10 pennies. One way to do it is I send a transfer of a dime to the other guy, and he sends a transfer of 10 pennies back to me. Now, this is for the birds, because one of those might go through and the other one fail, and then i got a problem. And the malicious attacker might be able to make ways for one of them to go in the other. What I want is what you do with stocks. I want to create an offer saying, I will give you a dime for 10 pennies, and it's sitting here. And then when someone accepts it, I want one move to do that. Trade the coins back and forth. Also, it either happens or it doesn't happen. But if it happens, it happens completely. That's an atomic exchange transaction, and multi-chain supports that. So you can make an offer in, um, in the Create Offer tab. So here, create offer. I'm going to offer a dime in return for 10 pennies. Now I've created an offer. Now notice right now I have 900 pennies and 100 dimes. But after I create this offer, I now only have 99 dimes. One of them is locked. The one I have offered is still mine, but it's locked. I can't do anything else with it while this offer is on the table. It's being held in sort of escrow. So that's to guarantee that the other person doesn't buy it and then find out that I don't really have it. So now the other guy can accept that offer. And to do that, you have to be uh, logged in for his machine. And um, that creates the offer in available balances. Uh, so to perform the exchange, you have to go to the secondary nodes GUI, which I haven't got set up and I'm not going to bother with it. And if you want to do this, you have two people doing it with partners to trade back and forth. But that's what I wanted to show you. That's the joy of multi-chain. You have permissions, and it's very simple and very easy to set up and very easy to use. And it is currently set to not have much difficulty in mining. This is the kind of blockchain that does not become public where the whole world can compete. So it's not a political statement to undermine the financial system at all. It's a way of sharing data to be used inside a company between people you trust. And right now, mining is only being done by the one node in the center. So I'm not having any illusions of changing the whole world here. I'm just trying to make a financial instrument that might be of use to a company to solve a limited local problem. And that's where I think the real value here is. That's where I think if you learn to program this stuff, you're getting somewhere. So I made a public multi-chain. It's been running for maybe two or three months now, and you can get points by joining my chain. I have Samcoin. Sam chain. <laughs> it's not worth any money. If anybody's paying money for this, God have mercy on you. But... Um, <laughs> But I just set up one of these on my server up at samchain.samsclass.info. Chain, after you get multi-chain running, you can join my chain. And now you can set up your GUI, join the SAM chain. And once you're in the SAM chain, you can then get points. You can get there's a faucet, which, is, which will give you free SAM coins. And then you can, um, once you do that, have a SAM coin. You then send a SAM coin to a certain account, and that, is recorded as proof that you're in, and now you get your points. And then um, you can even, there's also these things, you add yourself to this stream called winners. Now this is another feature of multi-chain, which I must say I don't know quite what they're thinking of, but you can put data in the chain. You can put in text data and it distributes on the chain. That's, so I made a chain called, a stream called winners. And you can put your name in the winner stream. Now, this had the result that after my previous class, there's a bunch of people in there, and I wanted to get them out of there, but that's actually very easy. You just stop the daemon, you copy that, that multi-chain folder to another folder, that archives the old blockchain, and you start it again and make a new blockchain. You can totally do that at any time. It's really nice not to be a public chain like Bitcoin, where I can't do that, and that's the kind of thing you might reasonably want to do. So anyway, um, all right. So that's what I wanted to show you. That's these things, Multi-Chain Explorer and Samchain. Sam uh, I think you've already got this thing going. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's how, you, that's how you get Multi-Chain Explorer working on yours. All right, so that's Multi-Chain. Now, I think I'm going to show you one more thing here. Um, I tell you what, I want you people to have some time to work. I'm going to practice this one because last time I tried it, it failed. So 
just go ahead and work on things. In about 15 minutes, I'll demonstrate this if it works. I'm going to pause the recording. There's a few new people here. If you get stuck, you can raise your hands. Yeah. You should all have something. All right, folks, I got something to show you, and this I thought was wonderful. Um, in the start of this year, some people at 4chan decided to make a joke of cryptocurrency, and they made Ponzi coin. They deliberately made a Ponzi scheme, and they said, of course, no one would be stupid enough to put real money in this piece of shit. And they did. They People put in about $800,000, and it all got stolen within hours. And since it all got stolen, there's a blockchain recording everything that happened so we can see exactly what happened. And the awesome thing is a large number of people who think this is all going to make them rich someday and have gotten enough money from suckers who believe that have funded a bunch of great Ethereum development tools. And so it is now very easy to reproduce the whole thing. You don't need anything more than a browser. When I did this the first time a couple of years ago, my students, we had to have Ubuntu machines, and our own private chain and all sorts of junk. Now you can totally reproduce Ethereum smart contracts with all these tools uh, which may actually have some value if they ever fix the problems of Ethereum and get it to scale up. I'm kind of skeptical, but anyway, it's good for us to learn about blockchain. So this is hacking an Ethereum smart contract. And this is so easy, it's amazing. So there's this thing called Remix, which is a JavaScript-based simulator of Ethereum that you can run in a browser without anything. Assuming it loads. There we are. And it starts by loading some kind of a contract in here. And I think that's actually the one I want, but I'm going to delete it anyway. All right, you delete this, and now you get the code. Since this is all open source, the real code that was really used in the real proof of work POWH coin is here. And this is written in Solidity. Solidity is the language you use to write these Ethereum contracts that run on the blockchain. And as you can see, it looks kind of like JavaScript. Like Python, it's really. I don't know why they had to write a whole new language for this, but they did, and it looks pretty much like all the other languages. So this 316 lines of code, or 306 lines of code, is the entire contract that runs this Ponzi scheme. So you copy that code, and you put it in here. And then it should automatically compile and I had to refresh it before to get rid of all these stupid error messages that are bothering me. I think these error messages come from the network being kind of slow. Let's just try reloading the site. I did get it to work once up here, so I have high hopes that my demonstration will work. That's the right contract, and there it is griping about things. I wonder if it is an issue of networking. Anyway, um, it looks like my live demo is going to fail, which is annoying. Um, oh, I, I here it is. Ponzi token. I suppose I just ignore all those errors like I ignored all the previous ones. Over here on run, you can deploy. Now, there are different simulated networks you can use, but the coolest one is the JavaScript VM. This will simulate a whole Ethereum blockchain and give you 10 accounts with money in them to play with, to practice on. And you hit, so it created, it did compile, although it put two up 280 errors, it's lying, and it did in fact compile. So in the spirit of blockchain work, we'll call that good enough and keep going. And so you deploy your contract here. So I've now written a contract, and it's been deployed into Ethereum bytecode, or whatever they call their compiled stuff. Deploy puts it out there so people can add it to their chains. And it costs money to do anything. So it cost me a transaction fee of some sort. Here's the creation of the Ponzi token pending. Notice that my accounts are up here. These guys have 100 Ether, but the first account has 99 and a small amount of Ether is gone. That was the gas, the transaction fee I had to pay to deploy the contract. Now that the contract is deployed, um, I should be able, now I have a bunch of buttons down here, and these buttons let me do things like transfer money. These are just like the GUI you saw for multi-chain. You can now do things within the terms of this contract, but you're not spending Ethereum directly on the Ethereum blockchain. You are within this contract, doing what the contract allows you to do, which runs on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And this is the whole reason Ethereum exists. You can have these smart contracts that are like applications running on the software basis of the Ethereum blockchain. 
And that's why when the big one that was supposed to be the justification for the entire thing called the Dow came out and people put $100 million in it and it all got stolen because of bugs in the code, the Dow people went crying to Ethereum and said, roll back the blockchain so we can have our money back. And Ethereum said, forget it. We just provide the infrastructure like Amazon. If you rent a virtual machine from Amazon and it gets hacked and you go crying to them, they'll say, it's not our problem of what you put in that machine. We're just providing the infrastructure. And Ethereum tried that, but they were eventually pressured into rolling back the Ethereum blockchain just to reverse the losses of people in the DAO. Anyway, so these are the uh, functions available to me in this uh, scheme. So now I can do stuff. I'm going to invest some money in the contract. First, I'm going to put 50 Ether from the first um, account. So up here, I choose the first account, which I've already got, the one with 99 in it. Now I put in a value of 50, and they make up their silly units of money. So a way is some microscopic amount, but an Ether is a big amount worth a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand bucks each by now. I don't know. So there's um, now I can fund the contract here. This buys me in. So now my balance drops down to a little less than 50 and this transaction happens down here and I have now put $50 into the smart contract, 50 ether into the contract. Okay, so that's the first investor. Now we need to make another investor. Let's take the second account, which still has 100 ether and let's have this person invest one ether with the fund button. So now their balance drops to 98.999 because they put one into the contract and they had to spend a little bit more for the transaction fee, which is called gas. And so now there's some money in the contract to steal. And now we're going to show you how to steal that money. Um, so the way you transfer money here is kind of like what you saw in multi-chain. First, you approve a withdrawal by account number three, and then you perform the withdrawal into that account. There's two separate activities. So first, I'm going to approve a withdrawal um, from account number two. And I'm going to say account number two can withdraw into account number three. So let me be very careful here. I have to get these right, or it's going to file up on me. So what I want to do is move to account number three and copy that account address. So Here's account number three, and that copied in the clipboard. Is this address starting with 4B0? All right. Now I paste, go back to account number two, and go to the approve button. So I want to draw the money from account number two, and I want to go down to the approve button, and here's where I get the parameters for the approve. And the spender, uh, that's approve. Let me go back and make sure I'm getting it right. Now I go down to approve and the spender should be 4B0 and the value is one. Okay. The spender is, yep, 4B0 and the value is one. All right. So now I am approving a transaction of one ether to the, that account there. That's the transaction. Down here I see some logs passing showing that that transaction entered the blockchain and did not produce an error. So now a transfer has been approved. Now, if I look at the balance of account number three, account number three did not invest anything. Account number one put in 50, account number two put in one, and account number three currently has none. So if I go into um, this function called balance of old, and I put in the address for account number three that's still in my clipboard, and then I call that function, I will see that I have a balance of zero. This is an integer 256-bit integer of zero. Account number three has nothing. Now, what was expected to happen here is I take the money from account number two and put it in account number three, so its balance would go up to one. But there's a bug in the code. So what happens is um, I'm going to move it from account number two into the contract address instead of into account number three. But I'm going to pay for the gas from account number three. This is going to confuse the software because it's poorly written. So I just have to be careful. Um, so first I go to get a clipboard of account number two. So up at the top, I have account number two and I copy that into clipboard. Okay. Then I go down to transfer from and put that in the from field. So transfer from is here. And I put that in the from field and I have to put quotes around it. Okay. Now, On the right side, I get the Ponzi token address. Okay, let me find it. It is above um, 
above the pink fallback button. There. This is the address of the contract. That's where I'm going to send it instead of putting it to the expected place. And that also should be in quotes. And the value is one. Okay. Let me just check this. It's 147 to 69, value one. And that's here, 147 to 69, value one. That should do it. Now, I perform that transaction. Some logs happened down here, and it didn't like it. Um, debug the transaction. Okay, this happened. Okay, oh, because I hit the wrong button. That'll do it. Uh, transfer from. Wait, what's going on here? Am I in the wrong window? Uh, I'm losing my mind. One of these was all ready to go. It was this one. I had, right, transfer from, I go here. I put quotes around that. No, somehow I erased it all. I don't know what happened, but I, let's see, I needed 147 in the top box and the 69 in the next box. Thankfully, these supposed random numbers never change, which makes it a lot easier to do this kind of stuff. Okay, and one here, there. So now I've transferred from this account to that account. I do the transaction. And again, it complains. Um, all right. Anyway, as usual, my live demonstration has failed. There's just too many little bits to do it live. But the one I did when I was not attempting to do it live went here. And what happens is you're able to confuse it. And you end up with this much money in your account. An unthinkably huge number. Because you manage to subtract one from zero and do an underflow. And wrap around to the largest possible 256 big integer. And the point here is... The reason this happened is because of the code that's written there. And here's what happens. There is a function called transfer from that transfers from one address to another address. But, and this, before it does it, it makes sure that the from address has enough money. If allowance is less than value, then revert. But if you have the transfer to address equal to the address of the contract, it moves you over to a different function. Instead of sending an error message and telling you to use the fund button, which would have been safer, it sends it to another function, and that other function performs the transaction, and it uses the wrong value for the from address. So it checks account number two and makes sure account number two has money, but when it goes to pay, it takes the account that's paying for the gas and draws the money from there, and that's account number three. So you end up subtracting money from an account that's empty. And that's the bug that made it possible to steal all the money. So anyway, you should try that one. And again, you don't need to install any software to do that. You can do that all in a browser. And I think I'll let you work on that a while. Let me see how the, uh, how the scoreboard's looking. Get rid of some of these extra things. All right. All right, we're back to something resembling the scoreboard here. All right, good. Oh, yeah, a lot of people are moving ahead. All right. Let me see how I'm doing on time. This is 4.30 to 7.30, and right now it's, okay, I'm halfway through. All right. So that's, I should show you guys stellar, but I'll pause a bit first, let you do a little more work. Ah, one of you has pulled ahead of this Beatwise guy. Good. Because he's not at the con. He's somebody doing this from another country or something. What's that? Yeah, Adam B is doing pretty well. Yeah, we're moving along. A lot of people are doing the binary games, which is fine. Crypto base sucks. <laughs> What's that? Someone's, someone's handle is crypto base sucks. Crypto sucks? Oh, well, that's possible. They're pretty good. Crypto base. Oh, crypto uh -huh. base sucks. Good one. What's crypto base? I mean, no, it's kind of a play on like Coinbase. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. Good. Thermochemical. All right. He's Let me make sure I'm on track to make the stellar blockchain work here. 
All right. Well, I think I should probably just go ahead and demonstrate some more things because I'm looking at it. And not too many people are, are uh, up to what I'm showing you. And you might want to see it, even if you're not going to do it right away. So let me talk about the Stellar blockchain. So IBM uh, worked heavily on the another blockchain, but the latest news is about them pushing Stellar. And Stellar is a very complicated blockchain. And the point of Stellar, this is an something from their documentation to help me understand it. Stellar doesn't have just a main server mining and then peripheral nodes that are joined like multi-chain. It has a bunch of servers. It's got the user and the client's endpoint, then a bridge server and a compliance server and a federation server. And the point of this is it's intended to be used by real banks for serious finance. And it is intended to meet all the government compliance regulations for regulated banking. So that is a really complicated job, and the end result is up there like a Windows domain with, with across forest trusts, which is equally complicated for exactly the same reason. If you're not messing around and you're running a real corporation, things get really complicated, and you need serious software to do it. And Stellar is designed to do that, and IBM is pushing it. And the cool thing about Stellar is you can use it without any great difficulty, as long as you have an Ubuntu machine. So you take your Ubuntu machine and you install Node.js and then a Node, I've never used this advanced stuff, modern, Java, modern JavaScript stuff, but once you put in Node.js, you can then make a web server with just a few uh, JavaScript commands and you end up with a miserable little web server that just says, hello world. Then you can install Express, which is another utility to make it easier to install um, more things in Node.js. And then when you put in, use the Express application generator, you actually get a prettier page that has this modern uh, Node.js appearance where things are actually styled nicely and you're using a lot of tools to do it. So once you've done that, then you put on Yarn and now you can run the Stellar demo app. And this app will connect to the Stellar test blockchain, which is a service they provide free. So you can practice using Stellar. So you have a local app listening on port 4000 and you can, this demonstration app only does a couple things. If you view the web page, it'll just give you an error message, but you can send a post request. And when you send a post request, it makes two accounts and you'll see them happen here. You send your post request here. It tells you account A created and it creates two accounts on the real test net. This is a public test net. And now you can transfer money and it will automatically transfer some of this money to the other account, give you a transaction in a format, and you can then view it on the real blockchain. Um, and this is the way the real blockchain looks when you go up there. So I just wanted to point this out. Um, if you're still interested in doing this stuff, this is one of the real serious contenders for serious work, and it's a good thing to get started on. And I'm working through the next project where you make your own. They have a Docker image you can pull down and run to your own server, um, and you can run it in what's called ephemeral mode. And I got that working earlier today, but to make it, but then it doesn't save the blockchain anywhere. To run it in persistent mode where it saves the blockchain, it gives me a bunch of errors and crashes, and I haven't figured out how to debug that yet. But they're all that way. By the way, I should mention, you know, it is all a mess. Multi-chain came out with a Windows version, and I tried using it a few months ago in Illinois, and as far as I can tell, it just crashes and doesn't do anything, um, which is true of a lot of this stuff. Um, so it is kind of horrible to see the quality of software that people are throwing millions of dollars into. But anyway, it's an exciting world to play in. Um, I don't think it's true anymore like people have been saying that money's going to fall from the sky if you put blockchain in your name. But um, it is 
it is another form of distributed data sharing which has some use. It is certainly about 1% of what the people hype is, but there is some value in this stuff, and there will be some good products, projects coming out of it. Anyway, I got a little more stuff to show you in terms of normal cryptography. And I mentioned this crypt tool thing. If you have a Windows machine, let me just close my Linux machines for now. I don't think I'll need them again. And for that means I don't need these terminal windows. All right, let's try good old Windows. Um, and I can probably use uh, this one, should do it. All right. Uh, if there's a virtual machine I passed around, but if you have any Windows machine of any kind, it's fine because this Cryptool software is just ordinary Windows software. The only reason I have to use a virtual machine here is because I'm on a Mac. Uh, anyway, so there is a tool called Cryptool, and I think this was written by German bankers to help learn cryptography. And there it is, CryptWin. The point of this is to make it easy for everyone to learn how to use cryptography and see how it goes without having to write any code or anything. And I think it's really quite useful for that. So you can now use a wizard and you can perform some simple cryptographic activities. You can do the Caesar cipher and here's a substitution cipher and here's AES. So the Caesar cipher, um, I do crypt analysis. Classic Caesar. All right. So it's the wizard, crypt analysis, and then next, and then classic. There's two. Classic is the old fashioned cryptography from, from decades and centuries ago, which is not secure enough for modern use, but it's still used for a lot of, a lot of purposes these days by things like malware to hide things. Uh, JavaScript developers want to hide their JavaScript, and by companies that don't seem to know any better, like Microsoft. Microsoft protects your um, privacy with the Caesar cipher. Rot 13 is what uh, Internet Explorer favorites are stored in the registry as, which is like too weak to be used in the Sunday comics. But anyway, um, no, no, they still do that. Yeah, uh, a bunch. It's anyway. So um, classic encryption. These are all the old ones that aren't that good anymore. Caesar is the simplest. And so if you go here, here's an example of some cipher text. Um, this I think is actually German. I wonder if we have English. And it doesn't give me the same text anyway. All right. So the Caesar cipher is where you just move the, everything forward a certain number of letters in the alphabet. So A goes to C, B goes to D, and so on. It scrambles things, but of course, there's only 26 possible shifts. And so you can just try them all until you get something readable and you get in. So it's insecure because the key space is too small. There's only 26 possible keys, and it's easy to try every possible key. So that's one of the many attacks that will break it. Um, this one will get in by doing character frequency, which is an even more powerful attack. If you just count how many times every letter appears, you can see which is more popular, and this is German, but in English, it's E is the most common, then T, then A, then O. So that makes it pretty easy to figure out what the shift is and reverse this. So this text up here, um, come on, stop messing with me. There's my machine. Okay, I wanna zoom in, there we are. So this text up here turns into this stuff, Gaius Julius Caesar, which is, for some ungodly reason, it's a quote from Caesar in German. But anyway, um, so that's the Caesar cipher, which is very easy. And I have some things for you to crack here. Here's a quote, which you can decode in the Caesar cipher. You can do it with that tool. Here's one that's too short. So frequency analysis will not work. And you'll have to try shifts by hand until you get in. And here's one that's so short and repetitive that neither of them is going to work, and you will have to Google and find other tools. And if you do CTFs, there are a lot of tools that people commonly use that will try other attacks. This is a well-trodden area of cryptanalysis, how to break substitution ciphers. And there are a bunch of online tools that use various cool techniques to do it. Um, you can look for short words and guess what they are. You can use letter pairs. There's a lot of tricks you can use. Um, and with practice, you can do it yourself without any tool at all. Um, and that's often also true for monoalphabetic substitution ciphers, which is what's used in the Sunday papers, crypto quips. These are substitution ciphers. So this one here, of course, you can do too. If we use the wizard, it's cryptanalysis, classic monoalphabetic substitution. So let's get rid of this one and do cryptanalysis. Next. 
classic next monoalphabetic substitution next and here we get again some english stuff i noticed right away there's a b and a b that pretty much has to be the word a letter a and so you can do that that's how i would do it that's how i usually do it by starting with short things but here um I'm going to let it crack it, and it's actually going to use a sophisticated algorithm to crack it. So when you hit next, it actually puts a lot of work into things here. It's trying different keys, and it's going through some kind of uh, multi-dimensional optimization process here to crack it. And it should find it before too long. Um, let's see if I can zoom out and see what the result is. Um, analysis. Yeah, and it made it. So it eventually figured it out, found out what the key was, and here's the deciphered ciphertext. Let me try and get my screen to work better. Control Alt, now Control, there we are. So now it turned it into this. So it found the key. This is what A, B, C, D, E was turned into this junk. See, B is A, and all the rest are sort of random. So it used a fairly sophisticated mathematical algorithm to get there. And I have, it explains the attacks here, dictionary attack, genetic attack, they're very, and here's some more ones to crack this way. Again, you can get points by cracking that. Now, the next one is AES. There's all this, this substitution stuff is not secure enough for modern life, but AES is. Of course, AES is only secure if you use all 128 bits of the key. If you somehow know part of the key, then it's not secure again, and that's what we're going to do here. So um, it's crypt analysis, modern encryption, symmetric. So you see these things. Cryptanalysis, come on, cryptanalysis, next. Modern encryption, next. Cryptanalysis, uh, okay, symmetric encryption, next. And AES, which is the one currently recommended for all military and civilian purposes, the advanced encryption system. And as far as anybody knows, there's nothing wrong with it. Even quantum computers are not going to break it. And um, so if we go here, we can now track it in various ways. Let me see which one I planned for in my project here. Um, okay, ciphertext only, and there's a key pattern. Okay, so ciphertext only is fine. So next. Okay. So here, we've got some ciphertext is just long hexadecimal junk. Here's the key. And in this case, you're going to know a lot of the key and only have three bytes of it you don't know. So if somehow you had that information, then this is only 16 million possible combinations. And one of the things about AES, not only is it secure, but it's carefully designed to be fast because that's another desirable design goal. So when they chose it in the competition, they made one, uh, chose an algorithm that can be calculated really fast on modern computers. And that of course means an attacker can try a lot of guesses really fast. And that's what's gonna happen here. So even though there are 16 million keys left, it's only going to take this thing about 30 seconds to try them all. So it, that for some reason, their graphics are bad on this step. But there it is trying various values. And it's going to just try a lot of keys until it finds it. And it will be able to crack it. In fact, there it is coming out down there. It's made some progress already. All right. Anyway, so the... Um, that's the game there, and I've got a challenge here where you have some cyber text, and you know um, part of the key, and here's another one where you know part of the key, so you can crack it with that tool. Now, that's not super exciting, but it does let you practice this. this. Now, that is classic encryption, which is no longer secure, and the modern equivalent, which is still symmetric key. Symmetric key encryption is the most common type, and it has the huge problem that you have to distribute the key to the other person. They have to have the key. So you have to have some secure way to deliver the key, so if you have that, why didn't you just send your message down that secure way? It kind of doesn't solve the problem. Key distribution is the fundamental weakness of this system, and it's very serious. And the cure for that is public key encryption. But let me talk about one other problem, which is this famous one, ECB versus CBC mode. And one good thing about this is it shows you another way to do this stuff very easily, which is Python. Um, that crypt tool thing is fun, but it doesn't generalize that well. So let's play with this one. This is a famous demonstration. If I save this image, I'm going to make a uh, folder here called Hope. Okay. And in my Hope folder, I'm going to save that penguin. Okay. And let's open the Hope folder here. It's in my Downloads folder. 
poke OK. And there we go, tux.bimp. So there is tux the penguin. All right. Now I want to encrypt that. You can encrypt it with Python, which is very powerful. Python is, most people, if you only know one language, you learn Python. Most uh, pen testers, type hackers I know, all learn Python because it is the sweet spot between ease of use and power. It is really powerful. It's even very fast, and it's very easy to do simple things in Python. So, um, all right, you can just run it right here in immediate mode like this, and then you can just type commands one by one the way I learned my VIC-20 back in the old days, where you just type basic commands one by one. You don't even save a file and compile it or run it. You just do things. You can do plenty powerful things right here. So the reason why Python is easy is because other people have already done all the work for us. We're just going to use libraries that other people wrote. I got no pride. That's fine. So um, I'm going to use AES. From the crypto cipher, I import AES. It needs a 16-byte key, so I just give it 16 bytes. Now I create a cipher object based on that key. Now, I can encrypt tux, but there's an issue about tux. Let's take another look at this file called tux. I'm going to open it with a hex editor. Uh, one I like to use on the Mac is called hex fiend, but there's lots of hex editors and they're all about the same. But let's talk about how image files are made. You have down here these are the color information. This is like red, green, blue, and transparency. Red, green, blue, and transparency. This is large blocks of gray, which is the background gray in that image. Up here is the header. About the first, somewhere between the first 48 and the first 64 bytes is the header. And the header has information like the dimensions of the image and the version of bitmap that's being used and the um, color depth. So if I were to encrypt this file and scramble all these bytes to random unreadable junk, I wouldn't be able to view it at all anymore. It would no longer be a valid image file. It would just be junk. What I really want to do when I say encrypt the image, I don't want to encrypt all the image. I just want to encrypt this part, the part that has the picture. I want to leave the rest of it alone so I can see the results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip the first 64 bytes and encrypt the rest. So a little bit, a couple pixels in the corner will not be encrypted, but all the body will be encrypted, but I'll still be able to open it to see the answer. That's what I'm going to do here. And that turns out to be very easy to do at Python. So you read the bytes from Tux and put them in a variable called clear. And that just takes this. So that reads the file. If I'm not in the right directory, pardon me. I got to move into the right directory, uh, which is home and then downloads and then hope. It's not going to find Tux unless I'm in the right directory. So i got to run Python. I need to create my AES object. And now I need to read in Tux. I could have put a whole path in that Tux file name, too. That would have worked. OK, now I've read Tux into a object called clear that includes all those bytes. Now I can encrypt it. So if I just try to encrypt the whole thing, I'm going to have some problems. The problem is AES is a block cipher. You cannot encrypt one byte with AES. You can only encrypt a block of 16 bytes. And then another block of 16 bytes, you have to have an integral multiple of 16. If you don't, you would have to pad it somehow, and that's going to lead to other problems we'll see later. But so right now, it's complaining that the length of that is not a multiple of 16. If I take the length of clear, it's that big number. And if I want to know if that's an integral multiple of 16, I can just take it modulus 16. Remember that modulus arithmetic you were doing? It has two left over. So this is some large multiple of 16 plus 2. So now I know how to get the piece I want, which is going to be clear trim. This, by the way, is something awesome about Python. If I make a string called A and I put in hello there, I need an equal sign. Okay, so I put that in a string called A. You can just pick the first letter out with A bracket zero. And you can pick the last, I can go one to three, and I'll get a portion of it. And I can even go minus two, and that'll give me the last two from minus two to one. It'll give me the last one. Anyway, this is very nice. You can easily pick parts of a string out by just filling in these indices. So with one line right here, I can create a variable called clear trimmed. 
and that will give skip the first 64 bytes and the last two bytes of clear and put all the rest in there. So if I did the length of clear, it's that. But if I do the length of clear trimmed, it's smaller. And if I run this, percent 16, it mod is zero because that's an integral multiple of 16. So now I've taken a couple bytes from the end and the whole header and removed them. And the remainder is multiples of 16 so I can encrypt it. So now all I got to do is create ciphertext, which is encrypted the clear trimmed. And now I need to rebuild my file. And this is what will do that. This is going to write a file containing that data. So what it does is I take um, the first 64 bytes unmodified. Then I put in the encrypted stuff. And then I put in the last two bytes unmodified. And I call the new file tuxecb.bimp. So that will create another file here. And there it is, tuxecb. So there is my encrypted penguin. <laughs> And this is, of course, the point. This is not what most people expect to see when you do encryption. I was intending to hide the picture. I have not successfully hidden the picture. So what is this garbage? This is what's called textbook encryption. This is called electronic codebook mode. You have a key, and you have a block of, of plain text. You encrypt it with the key. If you have another block of the same block of plain text, you get the same answer. So all it does is it takes blocks of code, this is gray, so it turns green. The next block is also gray, so it turns green. The next block is also gray, so it turns green. You've gone through the motions of encrypting something, but you're an idiot. You haven't actually resulted in hiding the information. And this is why they hate people who just got out of college. They're so smart, they think they know stuff. And they say, that's the textbook way to do it. And it's useless. You have to do it the real way that gets the job done, which is always a little more complicated than what they teach you in courses. So. Uh, that's why this is not very popular, although a lot of people make this mistake. Microsoft made this mistake. This is why you may, I don't know, you guys are doing this. I was actually teaching Microsoft Office back in these days. Um, Microsoft Office, I was, the, I was the de facto security guy at my company in like 1999. And we were sending, at that time, everybody sent data as email attachments everywhere. Financial data, personal data, everything. Nobody was aware that this was a bad idea sent stuff to the printer to print checks just all over the place. And I said, that's not safe. We should be encrypting that stuff. We should use Microsoft Office encryption and put a password on those Word documents and stuff before we send them off. They made this mistake with Microsoft Office. They didn't use this kind of encryption. So if you took a Word document that was encrypted and you took another Word document encrypted with the same key and just XORed them, whole bunches that were turning to plain text. Because any part that was zero in this would turn into the key and the XR just came right back because they didn't have any knots. They had no randomness. In it. And then this, many, many people made this mistake. This was a very poorly understood issue back in the 90s and the early 2000s. And many companies encrypted stuff with this because superficially the data appears to have changed and you think it's okay, but it's not really very safe at all. So, all right. Um, now, all right, that's how you get something to train. Now, so let's do it a better way. We're going to do it with the solution, which has become the standard solution of this, is cipher block chaining, which prevents this problem and causes another problem that we're going to see. And that, by the way, is the case. Everything always is. All you can ever do is trade. Like every time you put on an update, all you ever do is trade the old bugs for new bugs. That's just the way it is. All right. So here we're going to make... Um, when I made this AES new object, I could choose a different mode here. If I didn't choose the mode, it'll default to electronic codebook. So if I tell it I want to do cipher block chaining, now I have to have another variable in addition to the key called the IV. And now that I've got that, I can um, encrypt that data and put it in ciphertext. Stop. Uh-oh. All right, there we are. Okay. So that uh, puts it in ciphertext, and here is what writes that one out. So I've encrypted it with the other mode, and this is called tuxcbc.bitmap, and that's here. And that is what most people expected to accomplish by encrypting it. It's total noise. You can't see anything. The information is completely removed. That is what you wanted. So that's electronic codebook mode, and that's good stuff to see. Now, the other thing I would like to show you about that there's two, let me check one more thing. If I got quantum computing on here, I should. Yeah, we'll talk about quantum computing and we're getting there in a minute. 
um, and you'll do that also. But first, let's talk about um, hatting oracles. This is the problem with cipher block chaining. And that's here, the padding oracle attack. All right. So here's what cipher block chaining does. You remember we needed an initialization vector in addition to the key. So you have a block of plain text, you encrypt it with the key, but before you do that, you XOR it with an IV. Then you take the output of this and use that for the IV here, XOR it with this data before you encrypt it. Then you take the output here. That's what causes each block to be different because this is a, a more or less a random number coming down here. Now, when I first heard about this, it made me very nervous because when I was a kid, we did woodwork and you cut one board and use that board to measure the next board, use that board to measure the next board, and pretty soon they're wrong. So this doesn't look good. This one depends on that one, and this one depends on that one. It seems to me, in the first place, any mistake will propagate, you'll ruin the whole thing. But of course, in digital computing, you figure there won't be any mistakes. But also, it means it looks like there's a security problem here. Somehow this block is connected to that block. That looks dangerous to me, but I didn't know exactly how to exploit it. But other people did figure out how to exploit it. And here's how it works. Suppose you want to encrypt 47 bytes of message. As we've seen, sometimes your message is not an integral multiple of 16 bytes. So if you have a 47 byte long message, you need to add a byte of padding, which is this purple byte. Now, if you did that and then decrypted it, you get 48 bytes. Now, how do you know how big the end file should be? You don't want to just get a, a result that has extra bytes. You need to somehow know what the padding is. So the solution here is to use PKS number seven. This is a standard, uh, official standard, and the way it works is like this. If you need one byte of padding, use 01. If you need two bytes, use 0202. Three bytes is 0303. If you don't need any padding at all, you add an entire extra block that has 16 in every one in hexadecimal. So the point of this is now you have an algorithm to remove the padding. Take the last byte, and that tells you how many other bytes to remove. If the last byte is anything other than 1 through 16, then it's invalid, and you can give up. It's, if it is anything from 1 to 16, you throw away that many bytes, and then you can reconstruct the original file. So it accomplishes its design goal of padding it so I can encrypt it and decrypt it and remove the padding. So that's fine. Now... Suppose you modify it. Here's another evil thing. Here's what decryption looks like. I have ciphertext coming in. I take the first block of ciphertext, I decrypt it with the key, and then XOR it with the IV. That gives me the first block of plain text. Then I take the ciphertext, I take the next one and decrypt it with the key, and I XOR it with this ciphertext. This is very dangerous. I am now performing an XOR operation, which is very simple. You did it in the binary games. And I know this value. I can control this value. So, so what happens if I change this byte? If I change this byte, this whole block is going to turn into scrambled garbage. But this block is not going to turn into garbage. The only thing that byte does is XOR at the very end. So the only part of this that will change is the last byte. That is pretty strange. So what it means is I can do a weird attack. I can make it look like I have the key when I don't have the key. You're decrypting a message. I can modify it to make you see the wrong plain text. If I change this byte, I can control that byte at the cost of collateral damage of making 16 bytes of garbage. So this is a strange attack. I can forge a plain text message without knowing the key at part, making part of the message turn into what I want and let the rest turn into garbage. And that's how it works. And you can do it all in Python. And this project, you'll go through it. Um, you modest, you change one byte here and it scrambles up this whole block, but only that one byte there. And that wouldn't be so bad uh, if you didn't have another mistake made. And here's what, that's why this should scare you about cryptography. The reason why the padding oracle attack works is because there was a whole generation of cryptographic products that gave you an overly informative error message. When it was decrypting something, it wouldn't just say invalid resend. It would tell you if the problem was invalid padding because it did what I just described. The first thing it would do is look at the last byte. If it's not one through 16, it would say invalid padding. If it was, it would then look further and then there might be other error messages. It found something else wrong. That 
was the minor mistake. And this is the problem with math and cryptography. The mathematicians define a problem. Like I have Adam trying to talk to, to I forget the names, and Eve in the middle, look in the middle. Apple, Alice talking to Bob, and Eve is snooping on the transmission. That's, you make this problem. And they mathematically solve that problem. You have to match exactly the conditions. But when you actually build it in real hardware and software, you only approximate the conditions they set up. And if you make any deviation from their ideal situation, you make holes. And there are always a ton of holes. But this is one. So if you have a cryptographic system, and here's one that's vulnerable, all you have to do is copy this and save it in a file and you can import it. This is my system I wrote in Python, which is very simple, doing nothing more than what we've done here. But the thing about it is it gives you a padding error message if the padding is wrong. And that means you can, you can try all 256 values here until the padding is correct. There are two possible solutions. One is the original unaltered ciphertext will, of course, be valid. And the other one is the one that puts a 0, 1 there. So when you find the second one that doesn't return the error message, you know that this value is 0, 1. And you can therefore deduce this value because you know what you put here. So you can learn byte by byte this value to where you know what it is. And then you can put anything you want here, which when XOR with that will turn into anything you want there. You can make 16 bytes of plain text come out any way you want. So the attacker in the middle who is able to modify the ciphertext can trick the system at the other end into finding the wrong plain text, even without knowing the key. So that's pretty awesome, and uh, I've got it here. You can go through it, and you get on the board by successfully putting a message with your initials in. <laughs> so um, you have to take my plain text, my ciphertext, and alter it until it spells out your name to some extent, which you can do. Um, so that's that one. And I think uh, the last thing I want to show you, um, there's some RSA stuff here if you want to get into that. I think I may not do it here because it's kind of dry. But I think what's really exciting here is the quantum computing, and you should really check that out. Um, I went to a Cloudflare conference, and they had cryptographers there from Stanford and UC Berkeley talking about this. Quantum computers are coming. Now, here's something you might like. Uh, the NSA has been pushing elliptic curve computing for about 10 years. Now, that's because public key cryptography is very expensive. It's thousands of times slower than private key cryptography. The whole internet depends on it. We, that makes it possible to send a secret over an untrusted channel without exchanging a key first. But it depends on this fuzzy, unclear, imperfect concept called a one-way function. Now, RSA, you have a prime number and another prime number. You multiply them, and you get the product, which is a number that can be factored into primes, and that is the public key. And the prime numbers used to create it are the private key. And the reason it is strong is because there is no known algorithm that will reduce a compound number into its prime factors quickly. The only way that is known to do it is try every number up to the square root of that number. So if the number is long, like a few hundred digits long, that takes too long and you can't get there. But the weakness is somebody might find a smarter way to do that. And that has in fact happened. Um, the, anyway, the problem with RSA is that the calculations are very slow. Elliptic curve cryptography works based on its different mathematical problem but in the same general principle of having a private key and a public key and a hard problem that can't be reversed easily. But the uh, keys are much shorter and the computation is much faster, like 20 times faster. So the uh, NSA and the National Institute of Standards figured out that we could have faster, cheaper encryption and run it on cell phones and portable devices without wasting the power and the battery and everything by switching to elliptic curve cryptography. And by the way, they backdoored it so they had a secret key into it, which they didn't bother to mention. And it was Microsoft researchers that found that and exposed it to the world. That the numbers they recommended in fact implied that there was a secret backdoor. Uh, which of course was never proven, but widely believed by all of us that have watched the crypto wars. The NSA keeps on having secret backdoors and stuff and thinking we aren't going to find them uh, because that's what their mission is. Their mission is not to protect our privacy. Their mission is to create no bus. That's what they call it. They want to make a system that is no bus, nobody but us. They want to make a system where they have a backdoor, but nobody else has it because that is their goal. And they, of course, are talking about a different kind of security. Many 
consumers think security is when nobody can read my mail at all. But the government thinks security is when they can read your mail to make sure you're not breaking a law or, or a terrorist or something, but the criminals can't read your mail. And so anyway, um, they made this electric curve cryptography and pushed it very hard. And 18 months ago, there was a sudden alert from the NSA telling us to quit using electric curve cryptography and change everything because quantum computers are coming. Now, as far as anybody has publicly revealed, there are no quantum computers yet that are worth anything. Um, like blockchains, for that matter. But they are expected to be developed and turn into something useful soon, like blockchains. Um, and when, in my opinion, because I watched this happen many times, when the NSA issues a panic alert like that, that means they've got it. They're typically 20 years ahead of the rest of us in this stuff. I think what this means is they have a working quantum computer. I don't know that, of course. I don't have a security clearance. And if I did, I wouldn't want to get shot for violating it or be locked up like uh, Chelsea Manning. So, but um, anyway, everyone believes quantum computers are coming. The prototypes are out there. And it's IBM is pushing them so hard that IBM took a quantum computer and put it online so you can use it for free. It's a real quantum computer. However, the current prototype level of quantum computers are not going to really do anything important. It's going to, it doesn't have enough qubits and the qubits are not high enough quality, but it is good being fun and it gets you used to what quantum computers can do. And I should mention the consequence of this is quantum computers are going to destroy all public key encryption systems. They will not affect private key systems. Quantum computers cannot do infinite calculations. What they can do is make certain calculations much faster and they cause uh, private key encryption like AES. They, you can do, you can find a key, 128 bit key by only doing two to the 64 out calculations on a quantum computer. It, it takes you down to the square root of the number. But the design, the National Institute of Standards foresaw this, and when they approved AES, they made two versions, 128 and 256. So the AES 128 will no longer be secure when quantum computers work. But AES 256 will be secure, and as far as anybody knows, far into the future. Quantum computers will not be able to solve AES 256 because they would have to do two to the 128 calculations and two to the 128 is such a big number that all the computers working for all the time in the universe cannot do two to the 128 calculations and quantum computers can't do it either. So as far as we know, AES will be fine in the stronger version, not the weaker version that's common for non-classified information, but RSA is toast. RSA originally came out with 512-bit keys, and then we updated to 1024 and 2048, and even with a million-digit key, it won't survive quantum computers, because quantum computers change the entire order of complexity to solve that problem to where they're all easily cracked. And as far as anybody knows, essentially all public key cryptography is shot, and there is currently a, a competition going on with people trying to develop quantum-proof encryption. Nobody knows what it'll be yet. There are several contenders. The main one is one called the Last Hope, something called Lattice Key Encryption. But we're going through a process that will take several years of uh, cryptographers submitting things and then attacking each other's stuff and picking the winners. And there will, in five years or so, the NIST will have something they give the accreditation as the quantum proof algorithm we recommend you use and then all the government agencies will use that and all the people that don't trust the government will use the runners up just like right now figuring that the nsa must have backdoored it and we'll have the same arguments going on but at least we will be over the hurdle of quantum computers but here's what quantum computers do so it's the q experience is ibm's free quantum computer you can use so i'm going to start experimenting with a quantum computer and here we go. I think you'll have to make an account, but this is what it is. It is five little magnets in this device chilled to within a couple thousands of a degree of absolute zero. Those five little magnets have a magnetic field and the magnetic field can be placed in an uncertain quantum state and the different magnets can be coupled together so they're connected. Now, if I don't know if any of you go all the way back to transistors at the very beginning. In the early days, we did digital computing with transistors one by one, and we would put in AND gates and NOTs, which were diodes, and you'd build your circuit out of those. And that's where this is at. We're going to take these five qubits and connect them with fundamental bitwise operations to do little calculations. The same thing was true when digital computing started. You would practice using NAND and NOT to add up to something like, you know, XOR. So, the way you do it is down here. 
there's actually a language called something like Python you can use down here, but what is this nonsense? Maybe I need to load another browser or refresh or something. I think it might be like my last one. I'm suffering from low bandwidth or something. Ah, there they came up. Okay, here are my fundamental gates. Now let me get the tutorial and talk a little bit about, well, I'll do an example and then we'll talk about it. So here are my qubits. This zero in the bracket means this qubit is, there are five qubits, that's all I get. And this means they're currently in a certain state of zero. And in the world of quantum computing, a measurement is an operation. So what this means is I have something that's in a state of zero and I measure it. So when I run that, I can simulate it. And now I need to sign in. Okay, I thought it was gonna make me do this. Um, sign in with Twitter maybe? See what that does. Authorize something, sure, everybody can do everything. See if I care. <laughs> uh, if weird people hack my Twitter, that'll be fun. Anyway, so, uh, uh, all right. I wonder what network I'm using. Yeah, PSK network, huh? I wonder if that's the right one to be using. Well, that's the one I'm using. Yeah. Uh, well, it's pretty slow. I've noticed that. Maybe I'll just try a different network. Maybe that, how bad could it be? Nothing to see here. Let's not do that one. This one here. I don't, that one I have the key for. See if I can get a network that's actually fast enough to do this because it's not going to be much fun if I have to just look at static pictures. There, I'm connected to something neat. Okay, let's see if I can reload this page. It's thinking about it, chewing away, dying a horrible death. It could be a lot of things. Well, maybe I'll go through my, let me just try another one here. And uh, if this doesn't work, I'll try going through my phone, but I thought the fast network here would be better than my phone. At my college, I often have to use my phone and it might be the same thing's gonna happen here. So it's the quantum experience. And who knows? That's not very impressive. You know, this happened to me in one of my other classes and I attributed it to like uh, a problem at IBM. I'm gonna try my phone and if that doesn't work, I'll just have to talk about it without being able to demonstrate it live. Life is full of these tragic situations. Um, all right, at least I have a charger for my phone so I can make a phone network here. And yeah, don't tell me you got a low battery. I just plugged you in and stopped Greg. All right. Um, okay. It is uh, cellular hotspot. Okay. My glorious hotspot is supposedly running. Let's see if that does any better. Oh, did this actually load or anything? No, it's just sitting there forever. All right. So that's no fun. Let's see. What happens if I go through my phone? Okay. Yes. Might as well get rid of Bluetooth. We don't need that. Ah, it's connected through something. Okay, let's see if this will load now. Right. Ah, there. Well, at least I have some connection. Ah, this is the problem. I seem to have a miserable network, but now it's not bad. So maybe it'll work now. Let's try this. Stop. Reload. Well, cell networks always take a while to set up, but uh, it's looking okay. It looks like I can't show you this live, which is a shame, but life is filled with these disappointments and we will cope. I can at least show you my archived pictures. So, if you measure a single bit that's zero, then you'll get, of course, the bits are always zero all the time, 100% of the time. And what it does is it runs it 100 times. By the way, the difference between run and simulate is run actually runs it on the real hardware, and they limit how much you can use that. You get like five credits, you can only do five experiments before you have to somehow convince them that you are worthy of getting more. So I use simulate which is not really using their computer. And that you can do an infinite amount of. 
So that's classical measurement. Now, I wanted to get the tutorial here. There, here, this, this I can show you. This explains the principle here. But let me first start with, um, let's introduce some uncertainty. So here, if you measure three bits, you're going to, again, always get zero, zero, zero. And now I can put in a green gate. This X will flip a zero to a one. So when I measure it, I will always have a one in that bit and the rest are zero. This is still classical digital computing where it's either zero or one. To get real quantum computing, you have to create uncertainty. And that's what the H operator does. The H operator rotates it into an uncertain state, which has a 50% chance of being zero and a 50% chance of being one. And now when you calculate it, since I rotated it here, and, and uh, if I rotate just one bit, I will now have one bit that flips, a 50% chance of one and a 50% chance of zero. But if I do it to three bits with H gates in front of each one, I now have eight possibilities. There are three bits that can be either zero or one, and they're all equally probable, and it's not a perfectly flat line because it, didn't, it only did 100 reps. So there's some randomness here. Now, that is, that's quantum uncertainty. But to really get anywhere, you need quantum entanglement. And quantum entanglement is bloody awesome stuff. Quantum entanglement is what makes quantum computers powerful. So you put a plus sign here. This connects this bit to that bit. So this one is uncertain, and this one is certain. This one is sitting in a state of zero. But now I entangle the two, so this one inherits uncertainty from that one. The two are now tied together. And that means when I run it, Two bits flip. I have zero, one flipping to one, zero. They have to be opposite. This is what led to the development of modern quantum mechanics. Einstein figured this out and published it in around 1910. This is the Einstein Podolsky Rosen experiment. And Einstein regarded this as a disk group of quantum mechanics. Einstein did not believe in quantum mechanics. He thought it was insane because he came from a very long tradition, going all the way back to the Greeks, that said the universe is perfect and clean, and uncertainty and chaos is a defect of the imperfect human mind adding that in. And he said, it cannot be that the universe is intrinsically uncertain. The universe is intrinsically beautiful and logical, and the uncertainty is us. That was his fundamental belief, and that sounds pretty good. It sounded pretty good for thousands of years, but it happens to be false. The world really is chaotic and uncertain, and the smoothness and certainty is the illusion, which is more or less what the Buddhists say which appears to be experimentally true. And you get very much into cosmology and religion when you get into this stuff because it gets down to the nature of reality. But the point is, he said, suppose you have a particle which is in a high energy state and it can decay into a particle and antiparticle. When they travel away, if one of them, the original particle had no spin, when it decays, the particles that come out might have spin. One spin has to be up and the other spin has to be down. They travel to a distance apart. If I measure this one and find it to be spin up, I now know that this one is spin down, even though it's far away. Even if it might be a light year apart, so there's no time for anything to travel from this particle to that particle will tell it. So how does this particle know to stop being uncertain because I measured that one? This is what he called spooky action at a distance, and he said, this just shows that this is nonsense, and you're idiots, and there's no fundamental uncertainty about the particles. That uncertainty is coming from your measurements. But that turns out to be what really happens. That is how the world really works. It is really these uncertain objects that don't really live in a fixed place that are connected to each other by spooky forces that are hard to understand. And it's only when we measure it by observing it that we create this sensation of it being in one state or the other. So that means you can create, uh, if you think, and I just want to explain how the Shore algorithm works. The Shore algorithm is what factors prime numbers. And here's, um, if you take a guitar and you have a string and you pick it, you create a disturbance in the string at one point, which creates a lot of noise. You hear a white click at first because it creates a lot of high harmonics with no particular pattern. But then as it echoes back and forth across the ends of the string, all of them die out except for a few, the fundamental, the first harmonic, second harmonics, you get this note. Okay, so what you do with quantum computing is you tie together these qubits in such a way that they encode your public key and you turn it on and the motion of these quantum particles through this quantum simulator cause all the other harmonics to vanish except for the prime factors which come out. It's the same kind of process. You have to think all the way back to something called analog computing. Before there were digital computers, 
you didn't have processes, you didn't have bits. I had one of these. There was a temperature controller. I used them when I was in physics. We had these cryogenic things that would cool things down to a low temperature. And what did, you'd have this blast of cold gas coming from below, and you'd have this heating coil on it, and you'd have something, a thermocouple, that measured the temperature. And you would just take the temperature, the value, uh, voltage in the thermocouple, and the voltage you wanted, and you would amplify that and feed it through the heating coils. So if it got too cold, it would turn on more heat. If it got too hot, it would turn the heat down. It was an analog device that would accomplish a goal through the way the analog circuitry works. And that's what you do here. You arrange a pattern of these things, which will cause the right answer to be the one that it settles into. And then you start in a chaotic state and you cool the temperature and it settles down into the settled state and you find the answer. That's called Schor's algorithm. And it turns out to be very, very fast at factoring prime numbers. So fast that it's going to destroy RSA forever. But it's only going to do that when we have strong quantum computers. This quantum computer is not strong enough because it doesn't have enough bits and because the bits are not high enough quality. There's noise in these bits. You'd have to have a lot more bits and you have to have a lot less noise and nobody knows how to build them yet for any amount of money in the unclassified world, although I strongly suspect the NSA has, but I cannot prove that. And that's why people are talking, if you are worried about people getting in your data today, you're fine with RSA as long as you make the key maybe 4,096 bits. But if you want to guarantee to your investors and medical compliance regulators and everybody that it's still going to be safe in 20 years, then you've got a problem. And you better use AES-256. If you're using any public key algorithm from today, you really have no strong argument that that is going to stay secure for 10 or 20 years. And so that's an issue. Of course, this is the case with everything, password hashes and everything. If you have an old database full of it, you have to keep updating it every decade or two as the old algorithm is no longer considered secure in the modern world. Anyway, um, that quantum encryption is one I wanted to show you. And we're up to a half hour from the end. So I think I'm not going to demonstrate any more of these. There's some RSA here where you set up RSA in Python and do it. And um, I'll just mention this one in case you're interested. I was real happy to write this project. I've often seen these uh, encryption keys, these ridiculous things here, there. You've seen this nonsense, begin RSA private key, this garbage, you see it in like encrypted emails. I wonder what is that garbage anyway? I finally figured out what it is and how to take it apart. And it turns out to be pretty simple. You use the, it's, it's called the uh, ASN.1 format. And it's a series of things in a certain format and then all rammed together with the limiters in base 64. So in case you care, here's a project where you take apart those things. And what I had people do as challenges is reconstruct broken ones. So here you have to take one and find the private key from it. And here's one where I redacted part of that file. <laughs> and you can retake the missing pieces and reconstruct the missing pieces here because they're related to each other. There's redundant information in there. So anyway, um, but I was quite pleased to finally figure it out. I've been looking at these things for years and I never understood exactly what the heck they are. And all they are is base 64 of a thing that includes all the N, P and Q, E and D, which are the standard numbers you use for RSA, and a few other numbers with delimiters, put in a string, and then base 64. But um, it's not that hard to get it out of there, so I wrote this up as sort of a place to reference it. Anyway, um, I think that's all I wanted to show you. And we're gonna, I got another half hour before this thing ends. You go ahead and do things, and if, if you wanna do this later, if you're having so much fun, you wanna try tomorrow, or. Um, there's two things I should say about people that want to use this stuff. The first thing is, of course, everything is completely open. Um, I have a use policy, and my use policy goes like this. This is all Creative Commons license free for anybody to use at all. The only thing you can't do is hack somebody and break the law with it and then expect me to save you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, if you do something illegal with it, I'm not claiming accepting any responsibility for that, although the cryptography is fairly benign. Anyway, um, the other thing is, if you just want it to be available, right now it's right at the top of my page because this event is in progress. Next week, when hope is over, it will go on my old classes page. So you can still do the challenges and still get points. I will archive the scoreboard from tonight and put it on here so people can compare this event with other events. And it'll be here so you can do it. And if you want to put this stuff in your class, you can do that. You can use my scoreboard if you like. You can put it on paper, print it in a book, sell it and keep the money put your name on it. You can do any damn thing you want. Um, and uh, in fact, I had a guy do that. He took my stuff, 
printed it, sold it on eBay, and then the buyer contacted me and said, hey, you ripped me off. And I'm like, uh, well, it wasn't exactly me that ripped you off. He said, you should put a note on your website telling people they aren't allowed to copy it. And I'm like, you don't understand the internet very well, do you? <laughs> There's a reason why I didn't bother to put that note on my website because I know how much good that would do anyway. Remember when I first went to DEF CON and talked about teaching hacking, I said, hey, what am I going to do with my stuff? Am I going to try to copyright it and make money off it? I said, I will just look like an idiot if I go to DEF CON and say, I put DRM on my stuff. I don't want to be that guy. So a week before DEF CON, I zipped up and put on BitTorrent myself. I said, there. Now, I can, now that's over. <laughs> I'm like the Grateful Dead. The stuff is free. You only pay for the concert. So anyway, the, um, uh, but uh, anyway. So that's a question I get a lot. The stuff will still be up there, and you can do it, but what will happen is your scores will be archived. And other people have done this workshop, a few of them. Um, here's, there you go. This workshop has been done several times. Um, I did it, I guess these are all this year. This is a fairly new one. So I did it in Illinois at a bunch of teachers, and then at Circle City Con, and at uh, two other teaching events. So. Anyway, various people do these things, and I keep track of how high they got and how many students are in there. Uh, one thing I noticed is when I did this stuff, I did the malware analysis workshop, the one from last night in China, at Beijing, at DEF CON China, and they got the highest score of anybody. Those Chinese programmers are very smart, and the language barrier did not slow them down. <laughs> so, uh, as you might expect, I wanted to teach this workshop there. They wanted another one, and they said, oh, you can't teach cryptography in China. I said, sure, it'll be fine. And I said, oh, no, the Chinese will like it, but the U.S. will prosecute you when you get back. And I'm like, dude, this is RSA. You think I know any secrets? I don't know any secrets. This is stuff in every textbook. You think you're hiding RSA from the Chinese? They said, logic does not matter. The government has put China on the banned cryptography list because of all their piracy. So you can't teach cryptography in China? So I didn't. I don't know if they'd really lock me up. But I would feel like it was unjust if they did. <laughs> the Chinese already know about RSA, too. I know. Like, we think we're hiding math from the Chinese and the Russians from North Korea. Those people know math. You know, in Russia, chess seems to be the, the popular game the way football is here. Which one of us is going to get further on math, I think? Anyway. But anyway, I'm not allowed to teach them math because they'll never figure out math without me telling them. Anyway. Right. Sorry, people that are leaving, but the FOIA workshop is starting, and you're mastering. Oh, do we have to leave? Oh, you're kicking us out of here? Oh, they're kicking us out of here now? No, no, no. Okay. I noticed other people are packing up the site, and I was just wondering why. Oh, because somebody else started. That's fine. Feel free. Yeah, well, I'm I'm not going to be offended as long as you guys find something you like. The customer is always right. Yeah. I'm curious. A lot of commentary on various cryptos. Uh, yeah. Curious what you think of Ripple and XRP. Oh, and yeah. Cardano. Well, I don't know about Cardano. I do know a little bit about people are very mad about Ripple. And XRP. It's, it's widely hated, right? It's, it's widely hated uh, because it's not distributed and it's totally under their control. Uh, so the cryptocurrency purists are very upset that it isn't really properly cryptocurrency at all. It's controlled by one bank. And. Um, it's very strange that they call it a cryptocurrency. So I don't really know the difference. They do try to push it pretty hard. I know, I know well, Ripple's like foundational technology and XRP is so. Yeah, I know I actually bought some IOTA because I thought their their use case made sense, but their execution was terrible. And they seem to be total jerks. They got security bones and just ignore them and lie about them. So, so they They're seem to have- They're also trashed by people. Oh, well, they, they seem to deserve it. They, the actual, the reason why I got it is the first one that had actual use case that was not crime that I ever came across. <laughs> um, where their use case was that you could have micropayments from on your things devices. And I thought that was the first use case that made any sense. But their execution seemed to be terrible because what they did was they tried to invent their own quantum proof crypto. And like I say, don't invent your own crypto. If you think you want to do that, go beat your head against the wall until the feeling goes away. Don't write your own crypto. Unless you are one of the top 10 smartest people on earth, you are wrong in thinking you can write your own crypto. Just use the standard stuff. Yeah. Well, perfect for receivers, for sure. Uh, like TLS 1.2 and 1.3. Yeah, it's a very good idea, of course. Um, I mean, the uh, TLS versions before, I think, 1.2 didn't have it. So that means the NSA could archive 
network traffic and wait to steal the key later. And when they steal the key, they can go back and decrypt all that stuff. And now there's a separate key for every message so that that prevents that attack. So it's become quite popular. So it's, it's certainly a good thing. Yes. Yeah, each session, I think, he deserves for a session. So yes, it, but um, yeah, but I mean, it makes you more secure in general. And the point of all this, by the way, I, I, I suppose I should mention this in the crypto talk in case anybody needs to hear it. There's people that tell you, you can use something that will protect you in the NSA. That is garbage. There's nothing on earth that will protect you from the NSA. Or they're the military. Like, if uh, someone's going to sell you a suit of armor, they're going to say, this means the U.S. Navy can't kill you. The U.S. Marines can't kill you. You know that's not true. They didn't kill anybody. The president can get shot. What you can do is make it more annoying for the NSA to get in. And then they can't do bulk surveillance of everybody. They'd have to actually waste time targeting you to get in. And, but that's all you can do. So you have to make your threat model. If your threat model is the NSA, you're toast. I hope to God the NSA is not hunting you down because then you're toast. But if your threat model is like criminals who are just trying to steal your money, then you just have to make it a little bit difficult and then they'll steal somebody else's money instead. And that you can easily accomplish. Yeah. How do you build out a telegram? Like so many people use it, but it seems you have the wick and snake flow of it. It depends which photo is fighting it. Uh, yeah, so I hear people argue about this a lot. I mean, PGP is essentially perfect. PGP is what Snowden wanted to use, but it is so difficult to use that even as developers are quit using it. So there you have the issue. Usability is so miserable that nobody can put up with it. But people tell me Telegram is easy to use, and they like using it for that reason, even though it's less secure. Um, so I think most journalists I've talked to have standardized on Telegram as what they regard as the sweet spot, but um, I don't have any very educated opinions as to whether it's better or not than the others. I know RSA is essentially perfect, barring quantum computers, which the NSA might have. But I mean, the problem is you have these private keys. You have to have them everywhere, and when you buy a new computer, you have to move your private keys over. I've got like six public keys out there with RSA and people send me quick messages and I can't open them. I lost all those private keys <laughs> years ago. I also lost all the passwords to cancel them, so I can't even get them off the uh, server. Yeah. You know, and apparently everybody else did that too, including the people who designed the system. It is such a drag. Yeah, they, they, the recommendation is to first print out a, uh, to actually create a replication certificate and then print it so that you can revoke it later no matter what. Yeah, and you know how many pieces of paper from 15 years ago I can right. find? <laughs> it's the same problem, you know? Yes. I threw away those computers and the sticks and reformatted well, things and now. moved house and yep. had a fire. Same coin, right? The same thing that it yes. the private keys. So people are getting used to it now. Well, that's yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, the other thing about this is happening. The early Bitcoin wallets had random numbers for every private key. And that was secure. But if your hard, your hard drive, they were all gone and you lost your coin. So they switched to memory wallets where you start with a password and you hash it. And then you hash it over and over to make a series of private keys to make all your accounts. And then all you have to do is remember the password and you can generate them all. But then what happens is people will choose stupid passwords and the keys are predictable. So I thought this was awesome. A lot of people said Bitcoin has never been hacked. The blockchain is secure. And then last year, I think it was hope. The guy hacked Bitcoin on stage live. He took a memory wallet, he took a six character random key and put some Bitcoins in wallet, key, with the private keys generated from that. And within 30 seconds, the money was stolen because people are onto this and they are generating all these simple passwords and all the keys and you're looking for that somebody you're doing this and they will just steal your coins like that. <laughs> it was awesome. So I mean, people say it's secure, but nothing is all that secure. You know, everything has a weak spot. Yeah. Why is Coinbase on your list of the chair? Oh, Coinbase is widely respected. And I've spoken to law enforcement officials and they also agree. Coinbase is the, see, the, the, the legal difficult part of cryptocurrencies is the exchange. If you just have like a game like World of Warcraft and you sell magic items, then that can be legal. That's like in-game purchases. Everybody has that. There's nothing wrong with that. The part is where you turn it into cash and best cash and turn it into that. Now it's something like a stock or a currency or something like that and now you have all these compliance regulations so the point where you exchange dollars into cryptocurrency is subject to all the financial regulations and what most of them do is start not satisfy any regulations run for a while and then when the government comes they just steal the money and leave that's typically how it works but coinbase is determined not to be those guys so they are publicly running changing dollars to bitcoins and other currencies and they are trying to they have a team of lawyers and they are seriously trying to evade the law trying, the government keeps coming and demanding stuff and they keep 
having intelligent answers. The FBI came to them six months ago, and they said, I, I, they, I, I wasn't, from what I remember, they said the total number of people that have paid any income tax on their Bitcoin proceeds is 80 in the whole country. Therefore, we are assuming that owning Bitcoin is prima facie evidence of tax evasion. And on, based on that evidence, we are issuing a court order saying you have to give us full details of all your customers so we can investigate them all for tax evasion. And Coinbase said, we uh, really don't want to do that. And they negotiated and they settled on telling everybody with more than $20,000 in. And they handed it over. Because even six months ago? Yeah. How much was it six months ago? Yes. Six months ago. How much was Bitcoin six months ago? Oh, at that time. That was when it was hitting up there like ten or twenty thousand bucks. So it was a lot. Well, in oh, by, by Martin Luther King Day, it was yeah. It had fallen quite a bit. So yeah, it but it's still around six thousand. Well, six so. and a half months ago. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean anyway, it was on but I mean, Coinbase is seriously, that's why they've never been shut down. They're seriously trying to obey the law, no matter how crazy the law is, they're determined to be the real Bitcoin bank that is not a crook. So, yeah. so how come, I, I, Coinbase never told me that they paid money to uh, It was all over the news, but I don't know, maybe they, they you know, what the news said they did. Yes, there was, it was anyone that had uh, sales over 20,000. Yeah, so let me, let me get an article. Uh, is it sales or what? No, like if, they, if you had bought or sold, right. Yeah, Coinbase ordered to turn over identities of 145. It was November 2017. Yep. So there you go. Um, yeah. Coinbase story. turned over the identity of 14,000 people. They lost a legal yep. battle, and they had to turn over the investors above a certain dollar amount. So if you had a lot of money at Coinbase, 20, you, yep, 20,000. Yeah, that's what I thought. If you if you sent or received more than $20,000 worth of Bitcoin between 2013 and 2015, Coinbase did send your records to the FBI under court order. And by the way, I don't know if they're required to tell you. It would be polite, I guess. But I mean, they're certainly required to do it. The court order demanded it. They went to court. They lost. They had to hand it over. That's the case. This is why I went to um, a privacy convention in San Francisco with Bruce Schneier, their um, trustee con. And Bruce Schneier, I thought it was funny. It was a bunch of people talking about how rotten the government is. And I was like, they listed the FBI job application and how you're supposed to have all these skills to break into cryptography and stuff and other people saying look what bums they are and i was taking notes to make sure i teach all that so my students could get that job but anyway, i thought bruce schneier had the right attitude he said look they, they of course are backdooring stuff they want to get into your cryptography there's an attack the government has which is really hard to stop which is they come to you with a court order and they demand your stuff yep. you have to give it to them and your cryptography is not going to stop that Yep. And he said, and you, wherever you go, there's going to be a government overseeing your company that has some ability to inspect what you're doing. That's what it is to live in a society with a government. And where do you want to go? You want to go to China and let the Chinese government oversee no, no, you? Just, but, yeah. but in, in Panama. In Panama? Yeah, because I think yeah. in Panama pays for five thousand dollars, and you get the you get entry into the banking system. Yeah, and you can also. It used to be Switzerland, and then the Cayman uh, Islands and stuff. Yeah, there are places you can you can send it to a country like that where they don't comply with U.S. requests, and you might be all right. But then if they decide to take the money, which um, wasn't Panama but Port um, Paraguay, just decided to take twenty percent of everybody's bank account, oh. <laughs> and they just did. I was like, you can't do that. Oh my God! <laughs> they just did. Well, they told me maybe things can do bad. It's the time in America to put bank cards banking in. Um, yeah. You can do that here. Yeah. Well, I. I think if they tried to do it here, there would be some kickback of recourse. But yeah, you know, you would think after you do a thing like that, I wouldn't even trust your currency again. But um, no one's a crazy enough. I don't. Yeah. Uh, anyway, no it's, guarantees. It's a tough thing. Just because yeah. Coinbase is compliant and yeah. answers the yeah. request, how does that differentiate it from the legal bosses to Gemini and all of the X? Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, they, they are, the point is, I think you can trust Coinbase as much as you can trust any bank. Because they are not moving, they know who they are. They're really they're in it for the long haul. They are planning to survive. If people have a complaint, you can go to court and sue them, and they will be there and go to court and answer you. It's as good as any other bank, which is not true in the cryptocurrency space in general at all. But in some ways, that contradicts your position on <laughs> on Bitcoin itself, Ethereum. Well, I think if you went through Coinbase, then I'd say investing in cryptocurrency. Is no more dangerous than any other high-risk stock, like startups or penny stocks or something. You just 
be aware that there's a ton of high risk investments like this, and you probably do a lot better than Vegas. I mean, it's just, <laughs> the, it's, but people, a lot of people believe it's like the gold rush. Money's falling from the sky. Buy Bitcoin, you'll be rich, rich, rich. And that is just bullshit. It's, it's just like any other high risk investment. Risk is defined as the variance over the mean. Things that move a lot are called risky. And of course, there's a risk that you, it's possible you make a lot of money, but in the long run, you will lose. So when you bought the Bitcoin, you can yes. nothing. Sure, if you get in at the very beginning, there's an opportunity. If you were people to mine Bitcoin in 2008, then you get money for nothing. But after you hear about it, it's too late to be that on. And that's what people think they're going to do. And the same thing true that people went to the gold rush in, in California and stuff. Almost all of them just died on the way or didn't get anything. The first few people got it, and a bunch of people heard about it and rushed in to try to get it. They were pretty much hosed. Right. Well, but now Goldman and BlackRock are going. Who's that? Goldman Sachs. Yeah, BlackRock. oh, sure. But they're not going into Bitcoin. They're going yeah, into blockchain. They're doing futures and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, they're doing speculative trades. Yes, I mean, you can certainly be the stockbroker and help facilitate other people losing their money. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's right. a valid business model. I mean, that, that's why I say, you know, it's, it's gold rush people that got pickaxes and try to dig out the gold. And those people are fools and they got screwed. But you could be the guy that sells them hammer or pickaxe. And that's a legitimate business. That's why I tell students, you want to be the programmer, programming the blockchain, which they might get a cryptocurrency out and sold a bunch of suckers. But you're at least doing an honest day's work, getting an honest day's pay. So that's Schindler. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think this is, uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of studies have shown this. If you want to get rich, the best thing you can do is get a job and earn a normal paycheck. That will work out a lot better than all the get rich quick schemes. The reason I asked about Cardano is it's written in Haskell. And it's yeah. probably one of the more earnest paperwork projects out there. Yeah. It's a very interesting roadmap. And I, and I, I like the guy. I like, yeah. I like their attitude. Yeah. Uh, but, um, in terms of Haskell, I mean, the programming I, I've never used Haskell. I once did a CTF, and they wanted us to do up Haskell and all of our security classes. Who knows Haskell? Let me just crap. We need to get some CS students on the team. Haskell is pretty mind boggling. That's what I noticed. Uh, I couldn't figure it out in like a couple hours of Googling. Uh, you'd really need to like take a class to understand Haskell. I'm not qualified to judge it. It's pretty obscure. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why you program a cryptocurrency in Haskell, but maybe there's some reason. Well, if you haven't looked into Cardano, that would yeah. be an interesting. Yeah, I've heard of it. And there's a ton of cryptocurrencies like Zcash is big and Monero is big. They all have their special use cases, but um, I wouldn't put any money in any of them. Well, that, the, those are the zero knowledge proof ones that are actually used for crime. You know, yeah. They, yeah, the, like Gcash especially, in Monero now because you can mine it doesn't need machines. I mean, yeah, I mean, they those they all have use cases in forms of crime that are happening. All the other use cases are all guesses and hopes. But the crime is the big application right now. and has been from the start. Of course, another thing you could say is every technology starts out with crime. The printing press, the tele, everything starts out with something like pornography or crime. Those are the first people to jump on the new thing because they're the ones that can't use the old thing. So that is how things are usually funded at first is by the crime. And then the honest applications come later. And we're living through that transition. Well, every every right. tool has got a use and a misuse. Right. But the people that really need the new thing are the criminals who well, really have to quit using the old thing. Dollars use even more than what we're going to go for now that's for crime. And for, for, of course, like I said, yeah. I said, Bitcoin is for crime, but the dollars even more used for crime because you can't even track anything. <laughs> yes, that's true. Cash. At least, right, you yeah. know, they can track. So. Yeah, you're right. Cash is another way. Yep. You're right. And also, you talk about the speculators. Yeah, yeah. there's always going to be speculators. There's also going to be regular users that like the coins, that like crypto, that are using it for themselves. So in the There could run, be some of them, sure. So the price, maybe it's not all speculation. Everybody's, oh, the price is up to the moon. Speculators. It might not be. I don't know. There's a lot of regular users out there, too. Well, I think it would have to have some legitimate value for something other than crime to justify an actual price. I'm not aware of any, like, why in the world would a consumer use Bitcoin instead of Visa? There is no advantage whatever to them by doing that. Maybe they don't have a credit card. Well, they're pretty easy to get. But yes, if they absolutely can't get a credit card, that might be a reason to use Bitcoin. That's essentially what's going on in Argentina. But, in but someone who could get a credit card would be far better off to use that than to use Bitcoin to pay for whatever they're buying. Most of the time, 
how do you buy Bitcoin through an exchange without a credit card? Uh, you don't there, need an exchange. You find somebody down the yeah. corner to sell you Bitcoin. Yeah, there are people who sort of, but it's dangerous. You know, it's, you know, of course. You can barter and stuff. There's, yeah. there's, there are people trying to do that. And um, there are people trying to reach places where you can't get your credit cards. So, I mean, there are some use cases, but for anybody like in America, a normal consumer, for practical use, a credit card is far better than Bitcoin. And much less risky. You can appeal and get charges reversed and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's and it, you know, Bitcoin is not even cheaper to use. That's why, you know, it's, it, Bitcoin is an now, interesting Now it's getting experiment. really cheap. Uh, money keeps like every four minutes. Well, that's good. It was ridiculous for a while there. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, the, the main thing, the main, I think, long-term value of cryptocurrencies is to demonstrate the interesting uses of this new form of data exchange, which can be adapted into projects that might be valuable. And I think that's where the real value is going to be in not these public currencies, but in private uses inside companies and partnerships between companies to move information and money around between entities that are doing business together. And I think, that's why I think the private things like uh, Stellar, there's a real future there in Stellar developers and Stellar software. And I think every, all the big banks and companies are going to be using blockchain-based products within five to 10 years to do their business. And, and that's a real value. But the public currencies with everybody in the world competing and mining them is kind of nuts. And I think that is, uh, that is not going to have much in the way of real productive value directly. What do you think about the state? Proof of stake is a very strange idea. Oh, I'm glad you asked this question because somebody told me about this at Hope. He taught me about um, stellar consensus is one example. Okay, this is a well-known issue. Um, see, proof of work is where you have to do a difficult problem and prove that you're the fastest one on earth to do it, and that's what makes Bitcoin secure. But it doesn't really extend to other ones. So there is another one, um, uh, consensus. Yeah, Paxos. This is the term for it, and it's in Stellar. Paxos is the computer science technique of establishing consensus. The issue here is to handle the Byzantine problem. Suppose you have a bunch of people and you don't trust any of them, which is the case for like Bitcoin and for any other blockchain. And you, so you have maybe 10 locations of your bank or 10 other companies you're doing business with, and you don't trust them, but you want to like have a blockchain and you want to trust it. So Paxos is the system designed to solve that problem. And what it does is you can survive until more than one third of the nodes conspire against you. And it is pretty complicated. You have an acceptor, a proposer, a learner, a leader, you have quorums, you send a message, then people vote on the message, then you decide how much you like the votes. And eventually after sending many messages back and forth, you agree on this is the block and we all agree about it. And nobody can lie unless they get more than one third of the participants to all work together to lie. That's the point. And this is included in Stellar. And let me point that out because this, this is actually very important. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Stellar... Stellar consensus. They have a consensus algorithm. Because the Stellar consensus protocol, this is one of the advantages of the Stellar blockchain. And there's like talks about it and everything. And the point of this thing is, um, yeah, the technical summary I found to be pretty good here. Yeah. Yeah, get lost. Okay. So you have all these people in the system and you don't trust them. Here's what you might want. You might want decentralized, low latency, flexible trust, and asymptotic security. And these are different systems. And here's things, uh, Byzantine agreement is one way, and the Stellar Consensus Protocol is the best that solves every problem, of course, because they wrote the paper. Right. But still, it is pretty clever. So you have quorums, quorum slices, which are a certain number of people that agree on something. And then you have disjoint quorums. And here's what you do. You now have... Um, Someone is uncommitted. You're trying to vote on pizza or hamburger. This person votes hamburger. This person votes pizza. Then you have a quorum accepted as pizza. Then the quorum ratifies it. And you all agree pizza is the consensus. This is the issue. They have a complicated system of messages going back and forth and voting and confirmations to establish what is consensus among a group of people. Um, let me show you. I'm going to save it on my news. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's the idea. That's the model. You have, you have 10 people, you want to decide, how do you decide what is contentious among a group of people? And they, they usually use that example. I'm going to put it on my news and point that out to you. Here's seller contentious. And if you, for right now, that's on my news. If you go to my homepage, there's a news link. And it's right at the top. Yeah. No, that's their attempt to go to proof of stake, right? I tried to join it and the software wouldn't run, which is what I almost always find. But um, they are trying to address their scaling problem, which is horrible, by switching to something called proof of stake. As far as I know, proof of stake seems to be stake -like. It would mean that I trust you because you're rich. And I don't know how that changes from the current banking system. Exactly. It creates an oligarchy. Uh, right. So, so now you give up being decentralized. You, give, you might as well, the current system, like, why do you trust the certificate authorities in your browser? You trust them because we trust rich people. They're the kings and you will obey them. That's the current model. And that's gotten us pretty far. It's not that far from the old royal model where the blue bloods are a superior race and we obey them for that reason. Now we obey corporations because they're rich. That's, and the idea is the invisible hand of Adam Smith that they know that if they screw all the people, they will not be rich anymore and that's bad. So they'll be reasonably nice to stay rich. That's the theory. And while not perfect, it has some successes. And that's what a proof of stake is going back to that. Like Pi Gao, the richest person at the table controls everything. Uh, that's just a very curious place for a blockchain to go. I'm not sure that's where Ethereum really wants to go. Well, sh sharding is where that's getting worse. Proof of stake is getting better. Well, sh oh, sharding. Yeah, sharding and off-chain off -chain transactions, which like Lightning Network, which is more of the same. You have transactions that were not on the blockchain, right. not verified by consensus. Now you're back to just trusting a central authority for them. Right. It's kind of nuts. That's why, but they're basically going back to the single central server like Visa to get enough speed, which is kind of what everybody thought would happen. I mean, why would you want to do a compilation on a blockchain? The guy last night was clear about that, and he's right. Storing data and doing calculations on a blockchain is the stupidest thing you can do. Why do I make a million copies of data? Why do I do a million reproductions of the same calculation? That is the wrong kind of stuff to put on a blockchain. And I don't... And that's what Ethereum does with their smart contracts. The fundamental idea seems to me fundamentally stupid. And um, I think their scaling problem is very large and be very hard to overcome. But, you know, I'm, I'm no expert or anything. I've just learned how to set up a few simple cases. And there's all these people out there spinning endlessly complex new variants of it all. And out of all that madness will come some good products. And a whole lot of failures and fraud. Tokenization model. I mean, that's yeah. the biggest question surrounding any blockchain use case. Well, they all and, have tokens. I mean, but it's, there are so many that tokenization models are imposed on them that they don't necessarily need to be there. So, like, what is a tokenization model that actually matters? Well, I, I mean, you mean a currency? Well, not just no, but I mean, it, like, all of these altcoins are tokenization, right? I mean, I mean, the blockchain is just a way to store data. And the typical data you store is financial data, but it doesn't have to be. It's just a way to store data and have multiple copies of data with a high degree of assurance that uh, the copies are intact. That's all it is. And um, it is traditional to store financial transactions and call that a token and sell it to make money. That's the correct technique to make money, but it could just as well be other kinds of data. I mean, so I don't, I don't see, right, the tokenization is not essential to the blockchain at all. It's just the currently fashionable way to monetize the blockchain. And I think it's ultimately not terribly wise, and it will not turn out to be ultimately the best use of the blockchain. I think, I think what's much more logical, I think, is where what's stored in the blockchain is data about real assets, like real money, like your bank account. Not the money itself, but just records that you want to keep record of. And not the programs itself. That's why that's what I talked last night. I think he's right. What should have been in the blockchain instead of being the solidity contract should have just been like the hash of the solidity contract in your yeah, but they're trying to decentralize everything. That doesn't but that would oh, that but that would have the goal. Yeah, try, but see, to, that would mean to centralize the data, like keep it on a Chase Bank. But or, but or, still, or the point is, you, you see, then you would, you could download it from the URL and you could look at the hash to verify it was right, so you'd know if you got the real contract. So I don't see any problem with that. I mean, it's, it's like these crypto physics. You, you get the DNA, and then you download the image from a central server. That's still the, what you should do. Instead of storing the image on the blockchain, having a million copies of the same stupid image, 
You should sort of know yeah, how to trying to get away from storing on the server. That's why I'm trying well, to centralize it. They've been there on any, I think Ballast Knight had it exactly right. Storage is not a problem you solve in a blockchain. You already know storage is a problem you solve in a cluster. Or you can have a storage cluster to solve all the problems there, and that's how you do it. But you don't make an infinite number of copies of everything. You make a controlled number of copies that's and make them available. That's probably what you should do right now. I'm trying to think of the way to see. But I mean, that's the, the whole contract shouldn't be on every machine and it shouldn't be running on every machine. It should just be the metadata of the contract. That would, I'd say, be the next step for Ethereum. But anyway, it's, um, anyway, it's an exciting space. You saw the show again. I saw a little bit of it, I didn't see it all. Well, I was really, somebody got up and said, uh, well, the Ethereum Foundation's hiring us. She goes, she went to work in there. <laughs> like, visibly, like, yeah, boy, I would, I certainly wouldn't jump into uh, the <laughs> cryptocurrency space now without carefully doing your due diligence. Because most of the companies you'll be working for are going to be gone soon. And you know, I wonder if the checks will cash and stuff like that. You know, be careful where you go. Well, actually, I think that the Ethereum Foundation is quite legit. Yeah, they're not going to panic anytime soon. As far as it goes, they're probably one of the uh, safer ones to work by. So. But I, I, I wouldn't mind working at Coinbase. That would be all. Uh, they really seem to be serious about being in this for the long haul. And I think the checks will cash and your company won't get shut down by the government. Um, but I worry about the others. Oh, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. I like it. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so 220 points is the winner here. Adam B. Who's Adam B? Adam B. Still here? Maybe you left. You're Adam B. There you are. Adam B. Is the winner. This is what I often find: the quiet guy in the corner. Oh, good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you can do all this stuff in Python, of course. Good. I'm glad you have fun because that's what you win. Today. Yeah, that's all you win is fun. Oh, the USB stick. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, all right. You had a JFB chat from Las Vegas on your, uh, your site. Are you going to be teaching anything there? Uh, I would be there, but I didn't get to be submitted in time, so I won't be teaching anything okay. official there. I volunteered for something. They didn't answer me. I think there's something going wrong with the organization when I did that. There was a tweet saying, you know, this month, uh, we're late on everything. Uh, we're going to have a problem or something. So. I think it will be a little more chaotic than usual. Sure. But, but I'll be there. Okay. I'll, I'll try to find something to do. Oh, sure. I assume they'll have a CTF or something. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. We'll we'll see you yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the information. Yeah. Sure. I took your course, uh, your, ex your binary exploitation oh, course. One. I was one of the ones oh, that was sticking out remotely. Oh, good. Well, I still oh, nice. you guys a badge. Somebody sent me oh, right, right, Somebody yeah. sent me an image. I've got to work at it. I think you'll be asked, I'm going to do that again next time. That, that was a good course. I really enjoyed yeah. that. That was my favorite that I ever took. I'm going to start issuing yeah, yeah. some kind of certificate to people. There's a good case, course. learning and then reading the book. And <coughs> oh, good. What learned a lot. I, I'm, uh, I was Vegan J on there. Vegan J. Okay. Oh, okay. I see one. I was on there too. Yeah, yeah. good, yeah. I think I, I think I recognized you from that other one. Good. Yeah, oh, yeah, good. yeah. It was, it was good. Oh, I, I did all the extra credit ones. I mean, that, that, yeah. those were uh, some of the best. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think no. I mentioned to you GDB Peta a couple oh, times. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, and there's a ton of other tools. Oh, yeah, yeah. Radari and... I just did, and, yeah, I just yeah, did yeah, the most plain vanilla tool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Thanks again, Sam. Hope to catch up to you in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, take your course at advantage. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that would be uh, crypto. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, that's a good one. Right. If you do another one online, I'll sign up. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm planning to do them all online. Next semester is big night. Um, I'm going to do that one again. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and make my elementary course. Available online, 123. That's my goal. That'll probably have a lot of customers, so I gotta make it a total new. We'll see how that goes. It may or may not crash and burn. You had one, one assignment that was something about hack your CISSP. I think oh, yeah. as a joke, I said my CISSP. My actual CISSP. Yeah, no, I don't think that's a secret. If it is, I don't know. Yeah. No, no, the number's not still one. Yeah, I didn't think so. There might be there's some kind of algorithm to verify a number on like credit card. I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think there is. I it doesn't mean, look like it. Might look it it doesn't look like it. There's a website that you can go to that you put in someone's name right. and it'll come back. It won't give you their number, but it'll tell you whether they are verified yeah, or not. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's the way it well, should be. Well, I don't have to give you your name. It should be that number. Uh, I think actually you're right. You're on a number. Yeah. And it, doesn't, it doesn't link it back to your name. It just gives you a yes or no. Yeah. Well, one of the assignments was something like hack the CISSP number. Yeah, it was and I did a, that, yeah. and then I posted it. Yeah, 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 yeah
Yeah, you had yeah, yeah. to have a valid tree access from the next lot. Wow. And, and the only way to get in was to have a valid tree access. Yeah, because I don't know how to verify that. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. cool though. There's a lot of good stuff. Also, um, was it, uh, live, is it live overflow? He does a bunch of YouTube videos that are really good. That's similar to that. I think yeah. between the two of them, I picked up a lot. Oh, good. I'm glad you got working. So, uh, one thing I was just so I took a trip to the trip class, and it's okay. very much the same kind of your method where you build up, build up, build up, build up. Yeah. And one of the steps that we did in between, like, we actually uh, had started playing grow. So, it's a lot of dollars grow. It's a way of doing uh, computer network factors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. I did a couple of energy factorizations. I did the simple one. Right, yeah. Yeah, but that's right. It's an interesting issue. And also, so there's a uh, funny time yeah. that you can be already in the action. Yeah, there's uh, for testing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can hear what they are, but yeah, like generating yeah. them and testing them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.